Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Planning Applications Committee meeting of Thursday, 7th of June. Nick, can you confirm the sediment and apologies, please? Uh, thank you, Chair. We have apologies from Councillors Fairbairn, Gilroy, Hagman and Martin. We've got 17 members present at the start of the meeting. Thank you. Declaration of Interest members? John yes, Young, Chair. Ian Blake, Jim... Cool. John, oh, and Thank you, Chair. I declare an obvious interest in item number nine. Thank you, Ian Blake. I declare an interest in item five. Uh, I'm a very recent customer of one of the supporters, but this actually raises a question in a wider matter. That when you look, because obviously because of the, the recent change in legislation, the objectors' names are no longer featured in the papers. Uh, there, in item 5, there's a long list, and I actually had to get a paper copy to, to find out that I had to raise an objection. So I think it's <coughs> something that we really need to look at in the future for members. Thanks, you. I'll get our staff to address that when we finish the declaration of interest. H. M. McComb. Thank you, Chair. Item 6 and item 7, both the applicants and a number of the objectors are known to me. Thank you, Jim. Ronnie? Uh, item four, Chair. Um, I have an interest because I sit in Langham using the Wasika Community Council when the decision was taken on the vote on the, on the applicant. So I'll need to leave the room, I would suggest. Okay? Thank you, Ronnie. That's fine. Hey, Dougie? Thank you, Chair. Item eight. I was approached several times um, by a member of the local community for this application. Um, and uh, my only involvement in this was to provide advice on procedural issues around objecting. I uh, didn't discuss the application in any shape or form, and therefore there's no need for me to withdraw. Thanks very much. Do get Ian. Just, just to pick up, Chairman, the point that uh, Councillor Blake raised, I think, just to, just to declare at this moment in time, because I haven't seen all the names, if there is somebody there, um, I'm uh, blind to that, so to speak, so, but I will be staying in the meeting. If it comes up and it's obvious to me that I, I know somebody, uh, then I'll remove myself. But just that kind of broad context, that only if, if, it, if it comes obvious to, to, that I will leave. Thanks, Shane. I think that will apply to each and every one of us. And I have a declaration of interest in items 10, 11, and 12, and 13, simply because I've attended community events in relation to the proposal I've not involved myself in any way, shape or form with the plan application process, so I'll certainly stay here, but I've been involved in the discussion centred around these uh, gateway signs. If there are no other declarations of interest. We've come to the minute of meeting of 3rd of May. Is that a true and accurate record? Great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Nick, can you take us through the process for everyone today? And I should say at this point as well that uh, this meeting is being recorded and the recording will be made available in the future for public listening. Okay, thanks, Nick. Thank you, Chair. The Planning Applications Committee will consider each application in turn, as detailed on the agenda. The case officer or other appointed officer will make a short presentation addressing the determining issues accompanied by digital images. Any late information, amendments or corrections will be reported at this time. Members may ask questions of officers following the presentation on points of clarification. The chairman has been provided with a list of eligible representatives who have registered to speak at this meeting within the period specified in council policy. No other persons will be allowed to speak. The chairman will invite those who have registered in advance to speak to make their presentation, after which they may be questioned by committee members. No questions may be asked of members. The order of eligible parties being heard will be as follows. Third parties objecting to an application. Third parties supporting an application. Statutory consultees objecting to an application. Elected members of Dumfries and Galloway Council who are not members of the Planning and Application Committee. Such members should withdraw from the committee chamber after making their presentation. Applicants or their agents. Representors have been placed in alphabetical order and a copy of the public speaking list 
is available from the committee officer taking notes of our proceedings. Presentations will be strictly limited to three minutes per person, except in for national and major developments, which by their very nature are more complex, where the time limit will be five minutes. The chairman of the committee will ask you to come to a conclusion if you take too long. Representors are encouraged to use the time allotted to clarify any points they consider material and address the determining issues. Certain matters are not normally material planning considerations and will not be taken into account by the Council when deciding on a planning application. Representors should not raise any new matters without explaining why they were not raised earlier with the case officer. Please do not repeat what is in the report as members have already read the reports. After all the representations have been heard, the meeting is then in formal session and no members of the planning of the public excuse me, may address the committee from the public gallery. Planning Applications Committee will then proceed to determine the application or, where appropriate, agree a recommendation to be made to full council who will determine the application. Thanks, Nick. And I think at this juncture we'll deal with the issue about the names of objectors no longer appearing on our committee reports. David, do you want to address that in conjunction with Nick, please? Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes. All members, I'm sure, are aware of the changes which came in recently in terms of the, the general data protection regulations. Um, I must admit, until it was mentioned this morning, this is one of these laws of unintended consequences. I hadn't thought around this one, but I can quite appreciate it's a very valid issue. What we've had to do is data subjects, which are individuals. Um, until now, we've always redacted information which is personal data, such as phone numbers, email addresses, um, signatures, things like that, have never appeared online. The GDPR has made a change, which now means that data subjects shouldn't be identified as any living person and includes address. So we've had to effectively decouple the the names and addresses. So the important thing um, here is the address, so you can actually look at a plan and appreciate which are the, the actual properties which have been affected. But I do appreciate that for reasons of uh, declaring an interest, you also need to know. Uh, Nick and I have had a quick discussion on this, and I think we've got a solution to that. Um, rather than just um, get that wrong where we haven't thought around other consequences, we'll take that away and hopefully we'll have that sorted for you. We'll email out all members before the next meeting to, to make sure we've got a solution for that. But I think we can give you details in advance which will allow you to be able to look through that make sure you don't have any declarations of interest that you're unaware of. And the requirement will be that that information go, does not go beyond elected members, David? That's the problem, because um, you cannot share that information with other parties, so it would really just be for your own information and would then have to be deleted afterwards. But yes, we should be able to work around that. Members content with that proposal? Okay, thanks very much, members. Okay, we come to agenda item number four which is a plan application for the erection of wind farm comprising 12 wind turbines, maximum height of 140 metres to blade tip, site substation, temporary borrow pits and construction compounds, formation of access and associated infrastructure at land approximately 7.5 kilometres northwest of Langham, Hops Rig. The application type is full application, the reference number is 17 stroke 0415 stroke full. The recommendation is to refuse and the case officer is Andrew Robinson. Andrew, will you take us through your presentation, please? Um, thank you, Chair. Um, the, uh, the proposed site for the wind farm is within an area of commercial forestry uh, around seven and a half kilometres northwest of Langham and two kilometres southwest of Bent, Pan, uh, Bent Path, as illustrated in red on this slide. Um, the proposal comprises 12 140 metre high turbines to blade tip, um, the formation of an access road, um, substation and other infrastructure, uh, the full details of which are described in paragraph 1.5 of the report. Um, this is proposed turbine elevations, is a pretty standard three turbine uh, blades and the hub height and rotor diameter has yet to be decided, it's the blade tip to 140 metres has been uh, specified in the application. 
the proposal will require the felling of forestry uh, where it's um, stated that 179.2 hectares of conifer would be felled, which is illustrated in pink on this slide. And this proposal shows restocking with around 15 hectares uh, proposed in the form of Scots pine and Sitka spruce, which is illustrated in purple and blue. Uh, the green areas are the areas to be felled. Um, theoretical visitor of the wind farms shown um, on this slide, where the green illustrates areas where both blade tip and hub height could be visible. Uh, the blue areas indicate uh, where blade tip would be visible. And the proposal uh, is situated with the West Langham or Hugh Hill unit of the Southern Uplands uh, with forest landscape character, um, shown just here. Uh, other surrounding landscapes include the narrow wooded valley, which effectively follows the road up to Estale Muir, as well as the River Esk. Um, foothills with forests, castle or, and Estale units. Um, Southern Uplands, North Langham, and U Hill units, and to the south of Foothills, um, Annandale unit. And in terms of theoretical visibility within uh, the landscape character, as this is shown within uh, on this slide. So the red shows where the most turbines would be visible, 11 to 12, and blue being uh, less with 1 to 2. But the key's in the bottom right-hand corner here. Um, in terms of landscape designations, this uh, shows visibility within the Langham Hills Regional Scenic Area, which is just to the east of the site. And within the landscape architect's response, there's been reference to a number of recreational viewpoints. So we've included this just to, to show uh, what these are. So there's core path um, shown in yellow. You've got the Thomas Telford Trail in pink and the Estale Prehistoric Trail which effectively follows the roads, um, the road up to Estale Muir and the classified road that runs through the forest. Um, paragraph 1.13 describes the cumulative um, wind farms in the area. So this slide just shows these geographically. So you've got the application site. Uh, I should say orange I, is, um, illustrates those that are in planning uh, or yet to be consented, um, and the green um, illustrates those that are consented or operational. So you've got the application site, uh, you've got cross types, which actually has two applications, one of which was recently approved for um, an increase to the blade tip. So um, both, uh, both applications are shown on there, but it's really just uh, one proposal. Uh, U Hill, which is actually operational now, uh, Logan Head, which is minded to be approved, and Craig Wind Farm. Uh, there's a more recent application for Little Heart Fell uh, in here, and two to the south, the uh, Minsker and Solway Bank, which are both operational. Uh, community of ZTV, uh, this first slide shows um, community of impact with the proposal, U Hill Wind Farm and Cross uh, The green areas identify where you would visibility with hops rig and u hill uh, dark blue uh, would show hops rig and cross dykes wind farm and the red areas show where all three wind farms were potentially visible and the second community of ztv is between the proposal and craig wind farm where green areas are highlighted with both Um, heritage assets in the surrounding locality are described in paragraph 1.4, and there's quite a, a number in this area, so we've included this just to, just to identify where some of these are. Uh, the Bulk and Burn Archaeological Sensitive Area is just here, and this contains five scheduled monuments, um, to effectively prehistoric settlements. Newland Hill Fort and Craig Halstead Fort are to the southwest of the proposal. They're actually just off this slide, but they're sort of further down here. Uh, Camp Hill Fort is situated to the northwest, which is just here. And then you've got the Castleloa Hill Fort further to the northwest. And Shieldburn Settlement, which is referred to in Historic Environmental Scot yeah, Historic Environment Scotland's response, is situated just there. 
Um, and this slide shows theoretical visibility in respect of these heritage assets. Uh, the proposed access route um, is proposed to utilise the B723 road from Lockerbie to Estale Muir, where from Estale Muir would actually propose to use the classified road that runs through the forest, which is to avoid um, restricted bridges at uh, Estale and also at Ensign Home Bridge. And to access the site from uh, the B709 just to the south of Bent Path would require uh, um, an access upgrade, which has been illustrated in this slide. Okay, the remaining um, slides is to now show a selection of viewpoints and photos um, showing the proposal. So this one, uh, this first slide is taken, uh, viewpoint one, uh, which is to the north of the uh, wind farm, and it effectively shows an existing baseline photograph on the wire line. So in blue, it's showing the proposed wind farm. Green is Cross Dykes Wind Farm. Uh, black is U Hill, and red is Logan Head. Although I'll, I'll point out that the Logan Head proposal was actually changed when this was after this has been taken. So there are less turbines associated with Logan Head. Um, so this is showing the proposed wind farm, the y light, and at the bottom is the photo montages. I do have the visuals if, if it's difficult to see on the slides. Um, I'm hoping that they come out. Um, so that's from the first viewpoint. The second viewpoint is taken, again, looking south towards the site from the Megat Water Valley. So you can see the proposal, which would be in here. This is a, a more recent on-site photograph of the valley, just to give you a bit of an idea of it of its uh, context. And this is the, um, the proposal and U Hill wind farm from this viewpoint. Viewpoint three is taken further down into the valley, uh, into the River Est Valley. So again, you'll see um, the proposal situated in this area. And just to zoom in a bit more on that, um, the photo montages of the turbines. And this is an on-site photograph from that viewpoint give a bit of a bit more context to the site. And this shows um, the road leading up to the Megat Valley. This is actually look, looking further back. So the proposal would be uh, in this area here, just to give you a bit of an idea of the wider landscape. Uh, this is from the nearest settlement, Bent Path. Um, so the proposal, uh, existing photograph from the wire line. And I'll just zoom in on that. So just showing the, this is from the nearest settlement. Uh, viewpoint 5 is taken from Crumpton Hill, which is to the northeast of the proposal. And it's um, again, from an elevated viewpoint, and it'll sort of be looking, uh, looking down towards the wind farm. And it'll be shown in here, this cluster with uh, also U Hill in the background, which is here, and Cross Dykes. Uh, switching to viewpoints from the southwest, so this is taken from the road between Lockerbie and Langham. Um, where you've got the proposal, which would be in this cluster over here, and Minsker wind farm is seen here to the right. Let me just zoom in on on the site. So you've got uh, U Hill wind farm operational at the minute, Cross Dykes consented, and the proposal in here. And just slightly to the north of there is a viewpoint from Corry Common. Um, uh, on-site photograph shown here. So the proposal would be in this area here, and you've got U Hill and Minsker Wind Farm is, is here. Okay, I've just zoomed in a bit more so you hopefully you can see um, U Hill Wind Farm, Cross Dykes, and from this viewpoint, the proposed wind farm would actually sit behind uh, Cross Dykes. Um, this is from the uh, Kafaloa Forest Hill Fort, which uh, the landscape architects has raised concerns about in terms of impact on the rec a recreational feature and um, footpaths leading up to this uh, recreational um, viewpoint. So it's looking southeast towards the site, and from here you'll have cross dikes and the proposal um, situated in the foreground with U Hill behind. And the final viewpoint 
um, is taken from the Esk Valley. So uh, this is the road down from Estdale Muir leading towards Bent Pass. Um, so you'll see um, Hopsbrig wind farm in the foreground and other wind farms located behind. This is the zoomed in one. So uh, turbines that have been highlighted by the landscape architect as uh, problematic are turbines seven, um, eight and 10. And we've just got some photos from this viewpoint just to try and give a, a, a wide appreciation of this, um, of the visibility of this. So this is taken beside the main road um, application site in here. Uh, we've also taken some uh, photographs from further up in the valley um, because SLMUR, you go down the hill towards uh, Bent Path. So from here, you can actually see U Hill Wind Farm um more prominently and the proposal um again would be sat in here so U Hill is sat in here you can see where the valley opens out that's comments made by the landscape architect um in terms of the um views from the archaeological features mentioned this is from craig halstead fort which is to the southwest of the site um you can see the proposal sat there between U Hill and cross Dyke. This is taken from Camp Hill Fort, which is the closest one to the northwest. So it was shown in, um, in combination with Frost Dyke's wind farm. And this is a photograph of, of from this viewpoint. This is more to give you a, an appreciation of the wider uh, landscape and, and the visual amenity right, um, walkers would see visiting this viewpoint. And finally, this is referred to um, in HES's comments from Shieldburn Settlement and also Newland Hill Fort, which is a similar direction from Craig Halstead's fort. Uh, so in conclusion, um, officers have concerns regarding the design of this proposal and its scale and sighting of turbines, particularly on the northern valley edge, would appear overly prominent and overwhelming in relation to the scale and setting of the Eskdale Valley. It's also considered that the proposal would give rise to significant adverse visual and cumulative visual effects in combination with other wind farms from a number of sensitive visual receptors uh, as shown in the slides. Um, consider the proposal failed to address the guidance in the Dumfries and Galloway wind farm landscape capacity study and is considered contrary to LDP policies IN1, IN2, OP1C and OP2 and the accompanying supplementary guidance uh, on wind energy development is therefore recommended for refusal. Thank you, Andrew. Any members have any questions for the case officer? If there are no questions, then we have the agent for the applicant, Ian Sims. Ian, would you like to come forward, please? You have a, a five-minute window. Ian, you have a five-minute window to address the committee, yes. and I will remind you with 30 seconds to go just to bring your presentation to a conclusion. Okay. Can we go just to whenever the, you're ready. Can we go to the first slide, please? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Fine, Ian. Good morning, members of the committee. I'm Ian Sims, Senior Development Manager at Forza Energy and Project Manager for the Hoptrick Wind Farm, which is before you today. I've been working on this application with Buclu's Estale and Liddersdale Estate for the past three years. Before I address some of the issues that are presented as possible grounds for refusal, I'd like to set out some of the key points of relevance to this application. All of the proposed turbines are within an area identified by Dumfries and Galloway Council as an area of greatest potential for wind farm development. Hopfrig forms part of the existing and approved cluster of development in this area, which includes Uhill, Craig, Cross Dykes, and Logan Head wind farms, which has been approved by this committee and is just awaiting a section 75, these wind farms are shown on this plan. The significant effects of the application are localised, a point acknowledged by both the landscape and the planning officer. There are no other objections from the council's own internal consultees beyond the landscape officer or from statutory environmental consultees, including Scottish Natural Heritage, Historic Environment Scotland or SEPA. Only one public letter of objection has been received and two public letters of support this includes support from the Langham Initiative. Suggested reasons for refusal appear to be almost entirely informed by the Council Landscape Officer's response, which we consider to be overly negative, 
to overstate the magnitude of effects and to not reflect the correct position in relation to cumulative impacts. Turning to these landscape issues, the committee report and landscape officer's response would lead the reader to believe the effects of this application are overbearing and that Hopfrig doubles the extent of this cluster in sensitive views from the north. We do not consider this to be the case and I would like to explain why. Could we move the slide on, please? View point 14, shown here, is cited in the report as an example of Hopfrig doubling the extent of development. The Y line shown here is from view point 14 and shows Hopfrig with the operational turbines of U Hill and the approved cross dikes and Logan Head turbines. Hopfrig is clearly visible, but it does not double the extent of development in this view. Instead, it sits as part of the existing cluster of development. Based on this evidence, I think the statement that Hopfrig doubles the extent of cumulative impact here is not correct and should not be used as a reason to refuse this application. If we can move the slide on. Viewpoint 15 and the area around Shaw Rig are cited by the landscape officer as areas where Hopfrig is overbearing, a point which appears to inform the reasons for refusal. This wine line shows viewpoint 15. Again, Hopfrig is visible, but the turbines are not overbearing and are seen in the context of the approved Logan Head turbines. We can move on again. This is a view from Shaw Rig. This wine line shows that a number of developments would clearly be visible from this location. It's difficult to understand looking at this, how Cross Dykes, U Hill and Logan Head are all considered acceptable, but that Hopfrig is not. The report further raises concerns regarding visibility from Enzi Home Bridge. Roadside vegetation at Enzi Home Bridge means that there is no visibility of the scheme from this bridge. In my experience of onshore wind farm development, I have not seen an application that does not have some local impacts. The vast majority of wind farms consented by this council will have some degree of local significant impact. I would actually go further and suggest there are a few locations in Dumfries and Galloway where you could accommodate a wind farm of this scale with such a limited extent of significant impacts as we see here. In planning terms, we don't feel a recommendation prevents a reasonable balance and relies entirely on the landscape officer's response. It's worth noting at this point, the landscape officer also objected to the cross dikes tip point increase and to the Logan Head application, both of which have been considered and approved by this committee. To conclude, the effects of Hopfrig are very localised and is in a preferred area for wind farm development. Hopfrig compliant with planning policy. Hopfrig has received very limited local objection. Based on the evidence I've presented, I would suggest there is no robust reason to refuse this application and respectfully ask that you consider the wider planning issues and consider supporting this application. Thank you for listening. Thanks very much, Ian. Do any members have any questions for the agent? In that case, Ian, if you'd like to resume your seat, thank you very much for your presentation. Okay, members, we're now in session. Archie. Thanks very much, Chair, and I have to agree with, with the agent that there are, you know, quite a large um, amount of, of, of in-house consultees who do have no objections to this particular thing, and, and the landscape architect included uh, as the only one from, from the council. My concern is here, Chair, that we're actually seeing some photographs here that don't actually give you a better idea of the actual area. Um, I'm, I'm of the opinion that an actual site visit would be uh, beneficial to the Planning Applications Committee to go and have a look at this. If, if not for the wind farm, at least to show you how bad the B709 actually is, and we can maybe get some improvements in that from, from local council. So uh, I would like to suggest here on this then that, that we have a site visit and then bring it back at a future uh, Planning Applications Committee. Do you remember the support that view, actually? Ian, Andy, okay. I and Jane as well, maybe. Are there any alternative views? Jane. I would like to know exactly what it is that we're going to look at, please. What's the support? Well, I hope it's not a V709, Jane. Well, I think we respect, Chair, I think viewpoint 15, Shorag and Enzi Home Bridge would probably be the three areas I'd like to, you know, members to actually see. Because the, the, as the vegetation up there is quite um, hard, it's, it's actually good to have a look at that particular area. It will also give an idea of the existing and, and uh, up and running wind farms as well. Okay. So we have a proposal seconded by Ian. 
So, are there any alternative views? In that case, can you arrange a site visit, please, David? Hopefully in a day similar to today. <laughs> Thank you. Members, we move on to agenda item five. Plan application for the erection of wind turbine 60 metres to hub height and 80 Chair, I've got Ronnie Tate to come back in. Pardon? Councillor Tate. To... Aye, my apologies, yes, aye. Tracy, is somebody going to get Ronnie? Have you, somebody going to get Councillor Tate? Please. Agenda item four, Ronnie, the decision of the committee is a site visit. Come to agenda item number five, <coughs> an application for the direction of wind turbine 60 metres to hub height and 86.5 metres to blade tip, and information of access track at Plaskow, Kergunyan. The application type is full application. The recommendation is to approve some conditions. The reference number is 17 stroke 2034 stroke full. And the case officer is Chris McTeer. I'll just wait until all members have vacated the room before you start, Chris, please. Or members have declared an interest anyway. Thanks very much, Chair. Um, this application is in front of members uh, today as there have been six or more uh, objections received to it. Um, as you'll see from the appendix to the report, we have 16 letters of objection and 19 letters of support. Um, the application is for a single turbine extension to a cluster of three existing turbines uh, located to the southwest of Plaskow Farm. Uh, page 59 of your committee papers, uh, paragraph 1.9, outlines the, uh, the site history uh, surrounding this one and the existing turbines were granted planning permission in 2014. Uh, the existing turbines, there are three of them, uh, 50 metres to hub height and 76 and a half metres to blade tip. Um, prior to this application coming in, uh, we engaged with uh, the applicant in pre-application discussions. Uh, originally, the, the, the pre-application discussions we had centred around uh, an addition of two turbines to the three that are already on site. Um, in two different uh, arrangements, uh, there's a, a linear arrangement where there was a turbine on either end of the three existing and another option for the two turbines to be located either side of the central turbine uh, forming a, a cross. Um, following discussions around uh, cultural heritage to the north and uh, just how the additional turbines would appear in the landscape, we were broadly supportive of um, the addition of a single turbine to the south of the cluster of three. Um, the proposal uh, utilises the same turbine model as the, the ones on site just now. Uh, it's an Enercon turbine model. And the proposal is for a 60 metre to hub turbine with a height to blade tip of 86.5 metres. Uh, crucially, the um, the rotor diameter of the proposed turbine is 53 metres, which is identical to the three on site. Um, full details of the proposal are on page 58 of your papers uh, in paragraphs 1.6 and 1.7. Um, actually, if I'll just go back to the, uh, the location plan. Um, the, the proposed turbine is to the south of uh, the three existing ones. Uh, you can see from the contour lines there, that it is located at a lower elevation uh, from the existing three and the site is accessed from the west from the C6S public road. Um, the slide we've got here shows um, a wind turbine, which members will have seen plenty of before. Um, it's just a standard three blade horizontal axis turbine. Um, there's the site plan, so that's uh, you can see the location of the uh, the turbine relative to the other three. Uh, the, also as part of the, uh, the application, we have 180 metres of new access track and a crane hard standing, which you can see uh, in, the, uh, in the blue box there. Um, the site entrance, 
uh, utilises my only photograph. Um, the other ones that I took um, <laughs> kind of highlight the uh, the quality of uh, the digital cameras that we use. The uh, rest of the visualisations are ones that were supplied um, by the, the applicant uh, using much better equipment than we have um, <laughs> in-house. But uh, you can see the three turbines in the landscape there and the uh, fourth one is located over the hill um, to, the, uh, to the right. Turning to the landscape character types, um, you can see the uh, turbine located in the centre of the circle there and it's located in the uh, coastal granite uplands which is uh, annotated as number nine uh, on the, uh, the slide there. Um, it's just at the, uh, the transition from uh, number five, which is the Drumlin pastures there, so it, it kind of sits just in the uh, in the slightly larger landscape. Um, as outlined in the uh, in the report, the um, DGWLCS um, supports medium uh, sorry size turbine development within the uh, coastal granite uplands um, landscape character type. Um, just to remind members, medium typology turbines are between 50 and 80 metres in height and large typology turbines are 80 to 150 metres. So the proposal is, um, strictly speaking, for a large typology turbine, um, albeit it's, it's very much at the lower end of, uh, of the scale. Turning to the ZTV, um, you can see from the, uh, the cluster of colours there that the majority of the views are within five kilometres of the turbines with the remainder of the views more or less spread uh, to the north and west. But if I go back um, to the landscape character types, you can see these ones are, uh, the, the views are located from higher ground, looking over um, the sort of lower lying drumlin pasture. So from high ground to high ground, they are, um, they are quite visible there, as you can see from the, uh, from the ZTV. Cumulative impacts um, are limited insofar that um, the other uh, sort of clusters of development you can see are, are located quite a way away from that. And anyone with uh, with a, a knowledge of the local area will know that these uh, these three turbines are are, are quite isolated um, where they where they sit in uh, in the landscape just now. Um, the slide shows uh, route visibility from. Uh, the A711, which kind of runs through the centre of uh, of the circle there, the, the very innermost one. Uh, so that shows the main views uh, from the A711. That's the Kirkubri to Dumfries Road. And you can see the, um, the A75 uh, running just over to the west as well. Turning to the viewpoints, um, viewpoint one is a place called Torquira, which is just to the south um, of the uh, the proposed uh, turbine. So you can see the three in the landscape there, they're existing, and the wire line at the bottom shows the fourth turbine located to the right of the cluster there. And that one gives you the view. You can just see the blade sticking out uh, above the tree, above the large agricultural building there. Viewpoint two is uh, Knockwood. This is uh, looking south to north. And the wire line there shows the uh, the proposed turbine uh, sitting to the right of the one in the center of the visual there. And that's what that one will, uh, will look like from there. Viewpoint three from the A711. So again, you can, uh, you can see the uh, proposal on the wire line is to the right of the existing cluster of three. And that's what it'll look like there. Now, viewpoint four is uh, from the gliding club. Uh, so we're looking from east to west with the uh, hills behind the viewpoint. So effectively with, uh, with your back to them. Now, you can see from the wire line and from the visual there, the uh, fourth turbine uh, sits a bit higher up um, than this one. Um, However, this viewpoint is uh, at the end of a, a long access track through a forestry, commercial forestry plantation, uh, which is kind of situated behind you if uh, you were looking at this view. So the views um, are kind of limited in this way where the turbine does appear slightly higher than the, uh, the three in situ. 
Turning to views from Kurgunyan, uh, this is uh, looking to the north, uh, and if you look at the, uh, the wire line at the bottom, the uh, proposed turbine is sitting just to the left. There it is in the distance, just above the trees. Longer distance views, uh, this is just to the west of, uh, of Dalbiti. Now, you might struggle a wee bit, but I think the, uh, the wire line kind of shows the, the, sort of the, the, the best view of the turbines here, um, kind of sandwiched between the, uh, the trees just behind Dalbiti and the hills in the background. Um, I did try to get some longer range views uh, with our digital camera, but even zoomed in, you couldn't really see them, although they were visible to the eye. Um, and there's the, uh, the proposed turbine there is just uh, is slightly whiter um, than the uh, than the ones there, so it's just kind of mid shot, just above the above the trees there. Um, just uh, looking at the uh, the summary of the landscape and visual impacts, um, it is recognised uh, that the adopted guidance that we have within the DGW LCS makes no provision for large typology turbine development within this landscape character type. Uh, the proposal is at the very lower limit uh, of the, the typology and there are several mitigating uh, factors which, in my opinion, would allow a departure from this guidance. The, um, the candidate turbine is identical to the three that are already in situ. The, um, the rotor diameter is the same sweep. Um, it's finished in the same um, sort of semi-matte pale grey finish that most wind turbines are. But crucially, the base is located at a lower level than uh, the three existing ones. Um, the council's landscape architect hasn't objected to the proposal. Um, and in conclusion, um, it's considered that the proposal complies with uh, relevant policies from the LDP as noted in the report, and for the reasons outlined, uh, it is recommended that the application is approved subject to the conditions listed from pages 76 to 82 of your committee papers. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Any questions for the case officer? I've got David and then Jim McComb. Uh, Chris, I know that some of the objectors are uh, raising the sort of cum cumulative effect of uh, other wind turbines in the area, and I, I don't think on your graphic there you had the wind farms, uh, the turbines situated uh, along the military road, for example, which are quite near. Maybe I missed them. Just the other side of the A711, there are uh, turbines on the hill there. The, oh, sorry, um, yeah, the, um, the, the, the visual is taken from um, the uh, submitted, uh, the submitted sort of plans that came um, with that one. But uh, in terms of uh, the cumulative, I mean, uh, the landscape architects, um, sort of fairly detailed responses is in the report. Um, so, I mean, cumulative issues were taken into account. Um, yeah, I'm just kind of questioning. Mm -hmm. Robert, you can't address that. Thanks, Chair. I, I know the two turbines, you mean off the old military road just near Hockabar. I think the reason they're not shown in that visualisation is simply because of the scale type that's of a different categorisation. So what I think that visual is showing are the medium and large scale turbines prevalent in the area. I think the two at Hockabar from memory, I think are just below the 50 metres base to tip level. So I think on that basis they haven't been included. But we do have an internal database in our GIS system that shows all turbine types in the area and their status. So it will have been taken into account by the case officer when he's made his recommendation and the landscape. Do you want to come back? Well, only that I think it would have been a fairer representation if they'd been on that map and they're clearly relevant because they're, they're very similar and very close. Um, in 4.21 here, um, it, it ends up by saying there is no scope to accommodate turbines of this size in this landscape character unit. You, I mean, you, I think, commented and said, well, this doesn't matter because they're slightly lower situated. I mean, on that basis, you could have a wind turbine of 150 metres high if it was lower than one pre-existing one that was slightly higher, or 70, 80 metres higher. Would that be the case? Yeah. I mean, the, the report does clearly state that you know, I'm, I'm not. I'm not denying that the, um, the, the the guidance that we have says that there's there is no scope for it, but we believe that the 
you know, the, the lower level, the same turbine model, same blade suite. So what you see visually in the landscape would appear to be a, a natural extension to it. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to disagree with, um, with the DGW LCS. I mean, it's, 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 it's there and, you know, it's a, it's a document we work with all the time, but I, I do acknowledge that, yeah. Jim. Thanks, Chair. Chris, I'm looking at page 59, the site history. Could you confirm the number of turbines which have actually been consented for this site? Um, the, uh, the application from 2010 um, has expired. Um, there was anti-subject three only three the three that are there um, so the uh, original application was 13 p20129 um, that was uh, granted in March 2014 and in August 2014 14 p20310. Um, was a section 42 application to vary the original one. So yes, there, at, at that point, there would have been two extant conditions, either uh, two applications, sorry, either of which could be, could have been developed. Um, and so, yeah, the, um, the larger one was, uh, was implemented. Um, so effectively, um, the 2013 one became null and void because the other one was, was developed. So I just to it. clarify, there are only three permissions. Yes. And three have yeah. been installed, and the applicant, if we refuse this, can't build any more. No, no. Right. If it helps, Chair, just to clarify the planning history, you're looking at basically three locations for turbines, if you look at the precise locations of them, and there are various applications there, as Chris has pointed out. But because they're in the same location, it follows that you can't implement one and then the other one, because you can only have one turbine on the site at any one time. So there's various options there. But in reality, when it comes down to it, when you look at it historically, they've only ever been able to implement three of those turbines. There's been a degree of choice there, yes, but it's never been any more than that. Okay, Jim. Chair, that is the information I was seeking. So the applicant is not sitting with three unimplemented permissions. Thank you. Good, thanks. Okay. Other questions for case officer? In that case, we have, we have one speaker. We have uh, Rory Young, who is the applicant. And as this is a local application, Rory, you will be restricted to three minutes to address the committee. I will ask you with 30 seconds to go to draw your presentation to a conclusion. So just whenever you're ready, sir. Good morning. My name is Rory Young. <coughs> I am the farmer who is applying for permission to extend existing three turbines at Plasco Wind Farm with additional one turbine. The purpose of this proposed extension would be to meet the increased demand for electricity on our farm and is not for export onto the grid. As we continue to develop our rural business, our need for electricity is growing significantly. Our free-range hen sheds are now all powered and heated by 100% renewable electricity. By connecting our turbines to our new ground source heat pump system, we are able to use our renewable power combined with water taken from a local burn to produce heat for our poultry houses in a wholly sustainable way, thereby moving one step closer to our ambition of being the first to produce a carbon-free neutral, a carbon neutral free-range egg. We have planning consent for a further extension of our free-range egg business due to commence later this year. With a fourth turbine to supply the electricity demand, we would expand our private electric network to link this wind farm to the new free-range unit. If this development goes ahead, it will create work for local civils, contractors, electricians, builders and fencers for the next 12 to 15 months, and will create three full-time jobs and four part-time jobs. When I last addressed this committee in 2014, we employed 13 people. Since then, and with the addition of this next development, we have over 27 people on our payroll. It is also my intention to make this transition, whenever possible, to electrical powered vehicles in our business by creating a charger network which would utilise nighttime energy when our, supply, when our demand on site drops slightly. Throughout the development of our business, I have always been very conscious of the need to involve our local community, 
in any major development we've planned. To that end, I personally visited and spoke to all those living within one kilometre of the proposed new turbine during the planning stage. After consideration of their suggestions, I'm pleased to say that none of these people went on to object to the project. In fact, of the 34 letters of representation received by the Council, the majority were in support. After the original three turbines were granted planning consent, I set up a charitable trust with the help of Stuart to CVS. This trust now has a board made up of local residents who have awarded in excess of £14,000 to local groups, including an outdoor classroom at Kirkgunyan Primary School, contributions to Dalbeatie and Kirkgunyan Church, Dalbeatie's Men's Shed Project, and a study fees for a local student. As part of this proposed extension, I want to, I want to take the local involvement another step further by offering, by offering a 20% stake in this turbine to make it a truly community-owned project. One question which I also get asked regularly is, is this the last turbine? And I can honestly say, and I'm happy to put on statement here today, that this, if we're lucky enough to cons get consent, will be our final turbine on Plasco Hill. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, members, do you have any questions for the applicant? James, uh, David? Thank you, Chair. Uh, uh, Rory, I'm reading here that um, you're, I guess, currently, it says since uh, June 2015, um, creating enough electricity to supply uh, the equivalent of 2,000 homes. So um, does that electricity uh, power your farm? So you'd be up to 2,600 or so um, houses worth of electricity that you're using there for your farm. Is that right? We, we currently have a 1,500 kilowatt connection to the grid with Scottish Power, but that's restricted. We're not allowed any more export. And the three turbines that are on site just now are connected to our farm business through a private network. So what happens is we get first access to that electricity, and any electricity that we don't use then spills onto the national grid. So if this additional turbine were to be given consent, then we would not actually be able to export any additional power onto the grid because our grid connection is not expanding. So the intention is to use as much of the energy as we can on site. We're, we're heating, we use around about 6 million kilowatts of heat a year, which is quite a lot of heat, to heat these hens. So we, we do use a lot of electricity on site. And we actually, I actually have a document here which, this is a, a, a pictorial graph of the software which manages our internal network and the orange lines uh, bars show the consumption of electricity on a 24-hour period, and the white line shows our generation. So you can see there are periods there when we don't produce enough electricity, and these are the periods which we're trying to, to fill with an additional turbine. We also, at some point in the future, will look into battery technology as well to try and help. There are obviously periods where we're producing more than we need, and these are the times at which the electricity gets exported onto the grid. So what we're looking to do is we, we effectively have to work on averages. Um, obviously, the wind doesn't blow hard all the time, and a deal like this, we don't generate much electricity, so we have to work on averages. And on the average, throughout the course of the year, we don't produce enough electricity for our demand, especially with this planned extension of our poultry business later this year. So we're looking to use this software to help us analyse different technologies, and the most, ob excuse me, the most obvious one for us was, a, was an additional turbine to help us to plug these gaps. As I say, latterly, we would like to look at battery technology as well. We have also um, analysed solar. The problem with solar is that most of our heat demand tends to be at night when the hens are shut in the sheds because they're free range, and there's an obvious problem with solar energy at night time. Thank you, David. Is it, well, just for my confirmation, so you're using more than 2,000 homes would use at the moment? Yeah, the, the site at the moment produces about 5 million kilowatts of heat a year, of, sorry, of electricity a year, the existing three turbines, and the additional turbine would produce about an extra 2 million kilowatts. And we have a heat demand on site alone, just heat, of 6 million kilowatts. And we require all of the electricity for fans, for ventilation, for motors to run the site as well. So we do, the, the figure that I think people use about how many, how many homes a wind farm supplies energy for is perhaps a little bit challenging because it doesn't produce enough electricity for 2,000 homes all the time. It's an average over the course of the year, if you like. So if, the, if that makes sense. Thank you. Okay, David. Any other questions? John Young and then John Campbell. Hey, thank you, Rory. I commend you on your use of the turbines and uh, uh, from your answer to Councillor James, I see you're investigating battery storage, which is certainly coming in. As a user of an electric vehicle, I'm aware of the tremendous benefits of it. And 
have, have you an electric vehicle on site and a charger on site at the moment? It's funny you should answer, uh, ask that, actually. We just had a conversation with, and I can't remember the name of the Scottish uh, body who provides funding for charging stations, and we are actually looking at the opportunity of a public charging point on the farm. Obviously, it would be lovely for people to be able to charge their cars using renewable energy. We have, are looking at um, electric quad bikes. We're looking at electric uh, forklifts. Those two vehicles are in existence, and electric tractors are, I think, uh, it would be fair to say at the prototype stage at the moment. Cars and vans is something we're looking at uh, trying to implement over the course of the end of this year and start of next year. So we, are, we it makes sense for us to try and become energy independent if we can. We have that resource there already, and it would be foolish of us to keep buying expensive oil where we can use renewable energy. So, But it, you know, it will take time because it's quite an expensive process to go through. Thanks, John. John Campbell. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, could I ask uh, Mr Young why uh, this fourth turbine has to be 86.5 metres as opposed to the existing three at 76 and a half? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. That's one I've been asked quite a lot, and there's, there's two main reasons for it. The first one is that, I think as the, the planning officer pointed out, the site this turbine sits on if I go back, was originally we tried for, for two extra turbines, which was to try and again plug these holes. It's easier to do with an extra two turbines than it was with one, and the software gave us that information that we, we required two extra. But after consulting with the planning authorities and some of the locals, they felt that the turbine closest to Gatgunyan was too invasive, and that was the reason we dropped that. Um, so the reason that the, the fourth one at the south end of the site has had to go higher is because the location that the base will be built on is seven metres further down the hill. So if we'd built the same height of turbine, uh, it would effectively have been seven metres above sea level, lower than the, the existing three turbines, and that would have meant roughly a 6% loss in energy over the course of the year. So going that 10 metres up, and unfortunately the manufacturer doesn't allow for anything between 50 and 60, there is only a 10 metre increment in their, in their towers. Going that extra 10 metres gives us a 6% extra energy. It means that above sea level and visually the turbine is only appearing three metres taller than the existing ones, which is quite hard to determine from a distance. Uh, and also being perfectly blunt about it, that this turbine, as far as I'm aware, if it were fortunate enough to be given consent, would be one of the first in Scotland of this size, which would be unsubsidised. There is no feed-in tariff, there is no subsidy available to this turbine. So I'll, I'll be honest, we need that extra 10 metres to give us that extra 6% energy effectively to make it financially viable. Thanks, John. Andy. Uh, thanks, Chair. <coughs> um, good morning. <coughs> I'm, I'm, I'm just I'm trying to get my head around a bit here. The current development, um, you're at the maximum contribution to the national grid. Am I right? That's what you said. Sorry, say that again. The, the, um, the maximum, you're at the maximum contribution you can make to the national grid. Yeah, so the three turbines that are in yeah. situation just now are 1,500 kilowatts capacity and our grid connection is limited to 1,500 okay. kilowatts. Okay, so that, that's, that's clear for me. And then you say that you need this other one to, to feed the farm, actually, because you need it for the farm. So I kind of the question really here is, um, if, <laughs> why are you on the national grid, I think is the first question. Um, if you're, you're not getting enough electricity to run the farm, that to such an extent you're having to build, build another, wind, another windmill um, to do it, um, and you're not then entitled are allowed to contribute anything further to the national grid. Um, I'm assuming from this then you must have backup, other backup el electrical source systems during the working day. So I think a simple question is, that, uh, so this is really for the uh, e economic value of the farm and to your business, am I right? No, no. I, I, maybe I, I'm sorry, I'm not very clear explaining these things. The original three turbines were built in 2015. And when they were built, they were for 100% export onto the national grid. So that power was all for the first 18 months of that wind farm's life, all the energy went onto the national grid. Last year in September, we built our own private wire connection. So we, we buried a high voltage cable from the wind farm down through our, our business, effectively connecting our poultry sheds or the business effectively to the wind farm. And at that point, we then started drawing that energy back onto the farm. So the, to go back to why why did we connect to the grid originally, it's because we didn't have the private connection. The private connection was very expensive, if I'm being honest, and we, we needed a little bit of time to, to convince ourselves that that was a sensible thing to do. Um, the, the connection onto the grid is an import-export connection. So as well as us exporting onto the grid, 
on a day like today, we, we, I can tell you now, we will not be generating enough electricity from wind, so we are importing as well. So electricity just travels down a cable through the route of least resistance. It's like water. And our, all of our energy that we buy on into the site is all 100% renewable. It all comes from a company called Good Energy. So whether we're running on wind from our own wind farm or whether we're buying it in off the grid, it's all 100% certified renewable. So it, it's the electricity. We get first dibs on the electricity, if you like. If we can't use it all, then it goes on to the national grid. But we're already using a significant proportion, as you can see from that graph, of the energy the three turb <coughs> excuse me, the three turbines are producing. Thanks, Andy. Any other questions for the applicant? In that case, sir, we'd like to retake your seat and thank you very much. Members were now in session. Archie. Thanks very much, and I think this shows how good um, small business could actually make of renewable energy. Uh, and, and, and looking at the opportunities for some of the priorities of this council, we can maybe learn something from it. That being said, um, I would like to go with the recommendations and approve subject to the conditions. Okay. Hey, Andy, you're happy to second that. David? Can I ask a, a question um, of the officer at all or not? Yes. Um, it was just a... Um, about this being a large turbine in an area where there's no scope for such turbines. Um, have we allowed other large turbines in this um, landscape character before? I would suggest not be able to answer that, and it's not relevant because it's this application we're dealing with. Do you know anyway, my, uh, uh, Chris? Do you know the answer to that question? In, in that particular unit um, down at, at, at Plaskow, no, because those three turbines are the only ones that are that are there, and we haven't had any um, applications for, for large-scale ones there. Okay, so currently we have a, 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 a recommendation. Jane? Um, I, uh, I just want to say that um, I, well, I don't have any difficulty with the recommendation. Um, I, I will put a marker down that uh, I'm with the, the, um, the Council's landscape architect on this. I think it's only just accommodated within our policies, only just. Um, I, I would also like to say to um, members that um, this is about the only um, series of turbines that I s have seen which actually are sympathetic in the sense that they are green from the bottom and they merge gently into a silver um, area at the top. They are actually well thought out in terms of the aesthetics and I, I commend that. Um, which all, I think, just helps one to, to feel a little bit more enthusiastic. But um, no, I think this is at the very, very edge of what is acceptable because it's very visible from a long way away. So I will go along with it, but um, with that proviso. Thanks, Jane. David? Perhaps you're the officer will help me with the wording, but I think for the gain of 6%, we're setting a very dangerous precedent here by uh, um, allowing a large turbine in this landscape character. So I would like to be against this in some kind of way that you could help me. I think it contradicts OP1 and OP2, by the way. Well, you'll need to start because David's job is not the right a recommendation. All right, okay, well, in which... that case, I think it contradicts OP1, OP2, it's a, a, and um, it, it's um, in contradiction to the aims of the DGW L LCS, Danger President, and um, I make that amendment. Thank you. Would that be an acceptable amendment, David? Yes, I mean, basically the, the grounds of concern here are um, probably just an inversion of what's at the top of page 75 to a large degree that by virtue of the fact that this is a, a large typology turbine, uh, you consider it to be unacceptable uh, in that area. So that's acceptable. David, do you have a supporter for that? We have a, a, a proposal to go with the recommendation. It's seconded. We have a, an amendment submitted by David looking for a seconder. And if there's no seconder, you're uh, oh, Ivor. It was just with regard to the motion. Are we taking this as an exception to policy because it's just slightly out rather than actually agreeing it? No, it's an officer recommendation. It doesn't say contrary to policy. Oh, it does, in that case it is, aye. Is that what it says, aye? It's 
So it's contrary to policy, yeah. Chair, it's an approval subject to the conditions that's actually in the report, so. Aye. So, David, your motion or your uh, amendment falls. Uh, can you confirm the decision of the committee, Nick, please? Uh, the committee, of the, the decision of committee is to approve subject to the conditions as set out in the report. And David would like his dissent recorded. We, we can do that. Okay, we come to agenda item number six, <clears throat> the erection of industrial building classes four and six, containing seven units and retrospective temporary siting of two storage containers at Duncan Park, Wigtown. The application type is a full plan permission. The recommendation is approved subject to conditions. The reference number is 18 stroke 0147 stroke full. And the case officer is Mary Mitchell. Mary, when you're ready, will you take us through your presentation, please? Okay, we'll have a look at the slides first. Um, the application site is in the centre of that slide, and you can see there are quite a few dwelling houses. Oh, Mary, um, can you yes. just stop a minute, please? My apologies, Ian, I, I forgot to ask you back in. We'll just wait until Ian gets settled, then start again, Mary, please. Sorry, Mary. Thanks, Ian. Yeah, just start when you're ready, please. All right. Um, yep, there are a number of residential uh, properties um, surrounding the site, as you can see in this slide. And again, in this one, um, the site extends to uh, 1,630 square metres of slightly sloping land. It slopes up towards the north. Um, the... Um, the site is to access via the existing industrial site, which is just to the south of the site. There are two container units on the site at the moment, um, and part of the application is to um, gain temporary permission for their, their siting. Um, it's proposed to erect this L-shaped building um, it has seven units inside it. There are nine parking spaces. As I'd said earlier, the uh, vehicle access goes via the existing Duncan Park Industrial Estate. Um, there are grass bankings around the side of the, the site. Um, the grass bankings are much higher towards the north of the site and they, uh, they diminish in height as you go towards the south. Um, there's a proposed two metre high screen fence along the eastern boundary as well, which would uh, screen the rear gardens of the houses that you can see on the right hand side. You can see the, the seven units here. Um, uh, the one in the corner, unit three, is the largest unit. Um, and there's a, a small toilet and sink in each unit as well. Uh, this section shows uh, the, the proposed site levels and the existing site levels. There's a red dotted line. And you can see um, towards number two, um, Low Duncan Field, um, that's the, uh, the biggest drop there. It's, uh, it's over two metres of land would be um, excavated down and a banking would be created there. And these sections show um, what the views would be like um, from the, the north, the west, and the east um, sides of the building. Um, so the top one, the north boundary, that would be from number two, Lou Duncan Field. You would see um, the, the existing screen fence there and just the top of the, the roof. From the, the west, is um, there was a, a house which was approved on... Um, uh, a site adjacent to the west of the site. Um, it's not erected um, uh, yet, but that's the view that they would get from that side. Um, and then on, from the east side, which is the rear uh, gardens of those four dwelling houses, um, you would see um, the this new screen fence and uh, the top of the, the roof and a bit of wall. Uh, the site photos. So this is looking along Jubilee Terrace. 
Yes, the site entrance is just on the right. This is looking along the eastern boundary where the new screen fence would go. That's looking northwest. This is at the top of the site, looking south towards the existing industrial park. Um, this is the application site, and just beyond the stob and wire fence is the, the application site which was approved in December 2017 for a new house. The existing screen fence at the, the north boundary of the site. So this is the, the rear of the dwelling houses to the east of the site. That's number two, Lou Duncan Field. Again, that's the site of the new dwelling house in front of you. This is looking down Jubilee Terrace. This is the existing uh, industrial units at, Dun at Duncan Park. The existing access onto Jubilee Terrace. Um, there were a number, uh, 22 objections received against this application, including one from the Wigton Community Council. Uh, these objections had been submitted prior to the amendments uh, being made the main amendment the applicant proposed was for the units to exclude use, use class 5, which is for general industrial use. Um, the applicant proposes to have just use class 4, which is for business, and use class 6, which is for storage and distribution only. Um, use class 4 is, by definition, compatible with a residential area. Uh, use class 6, uh, in this circumstance, has an element of self-regulation due to the limited vehicle access and the limited scale of the units. Uh, other amendments submitted showed a level site with the grass banking and the screen fence to the east boundary, as you saw on the site sections. Um, these, uh, this reduced the visual impact of the building and also the impact of uh, any overlook or privacy concerns. Um, it's considered that the amended proposal would not impact detrimentally on the residential immunity of the area and additionally, the proposal would provide an opportunity for economic growth. Uh, the recommendation is for approval subject to conditions. Thank you, Mary. Any question? I've got Andy and then Jim McComb. So just for clarity, is, is it on the LDP as white land? Is, it, is that what it's shown? Is, is it, it is. It's unallocated use? land. Thank yes. you. Jim McComb. Uh, just following up that point, as unallocated land, it could equally well accommodate housing. Is that correct? Yes. Subject to the same yep. sort of um, uh, immunity. And Jimmy, when come issues. back? Yes. A, a second point, uh, Chair. The original proposal, you said, Mary, was for eight units. This has been reduced to seven. But has the overall footprint of the building been reduced? Mary? I would need to check that. Um, not significantly reduced. I'm, I'm afraid I haven't, I haven't measured the original um, footprint area. But, sorry. Uh, David, as Jesse might ask the agent, they, they, they're present. You'll get your opportunity then, Jim. Although clearly it will reduce the vehicle or flow because there will be less, say, uh, unit space available to individual businesses. Uh, David McKee. Hi, it's just to look at the pictures you've got. The, the people that live in the residential properties don't seem to use the back area for their cars or anything like that. And with the fence, and I think you're going to put up, that would be blocked off anyway. Is that the situation? Mary? Sorry, you, you you think they park their cars 
no, on the they, industrial they don't side. Seem to, they don't seem to access the houses from the rear, or the gardens from the rear. And this is going to be closed off, so if they want to can take stuff out of their garden and rather than cart, I don't know how they get it, to cart it through the house or whatever. It's uh, how, how they would do that, but then it seem to use it now, that's... Just, uh, they've got, a, got walls there, and it didn't seem to use the back access. I, I, I was just wondering, once that fence is up, that's it, they've had it. As far as I know, there's no existing access from the rear to the rear gardens for those houses. It must just access through the houses. Ah, but we, we don't know, there's no objections, so we'll just let it go with it. We don't provide free access through council land or anybody else's private land to joke if it's no access, it's no access. Uh, Ian Blake, did you want to speak? Yeah, yes, Chairman, thank you. Uh, the relevance you made to Class 6, you said it was self-regulating because of the, the size of the buildings and the access. Uh, that doesn't, however, consider the, the hours of business that a distribution centre may have. Would you like to comment on that? Mary? No, I hadn't included any conditions to restrict the hours of business or the, the days of business. Um, like I'd said, I, I thought it was self-regulating self enough. Yeah. D David might want to clarify that for you, Ian. We, we did look into that um, as whether or not that was going to be a, a necessary thing to actually add. Came to the conclusion that it, it wasn't necessary uh, to actually do that, but obviously it is a matter of which if members have concerns about it, it would be open to yourselves to attach a, an hours of operation condition, but that would then apply um, a greater restriction on the, the use of it, obviously. Yeah, I may come back on that one during the session. <coughs> Fine, yeah, okay. Are there any other questions for the case officer? In that case, we have two joint speakers, Hazel Smith and Jack Vines. Uh, oh, Jim, sorry. Thanks, Chair. Mary, can you confirm that there are no other areas of land designated for industrial use in Wigtown? Mary? In the town itself, the Duncan Park Industrial Estate is the only exist. It's the only established um, industrial uh, business and industrial site. Um, there is something out at Bladnach. I would need to check the. I think David is looking up the the local plan at the moment. Jim, if it'll help, David has LDP one in front of him. He'll can help you with the response. Uh, yes, Chair. I don't know if you can see it from this distance, but uh, that's the, the Wigton inset map, and that's Duncan Park here. That's the only identified established area, and there's no other proposed areas in the, the current plan. But there is obviously plenty of uh, white land around the place, but potentially could be used in the same manner as this application has come forward. Jane. Um, Chairman, I think lots of members got a, a letter um, about uh, the Roads Department's um, um, comments, and I wonder if Mary could help me with the, um, the um, questions that were raised. Um, one of the ones um, I think here was about the width of the road um, and some, the fact that somebody has applied for a disabled space outside their house, which is stipulates should be a minimum of 4.8 long by 2.4 wide. Do you know what I'm talking about, that, um, that, that that only leaves three metres wide where there is already a pinch point? Can you, can you comment on that at all? Before please, you do me? that, Mary, remember, that's not a given, Jane. Eh, because someone applies for a disabled parking space doesn't mean it goes in that particular spot, although clearly that would be down to the roads department. That hasn't been approved as far as I understand. Mary? Uh, the roads uh, officer has been on site and has looked at Jubilee Crescent and their comments are in paragraph 2.2. Um, one of the things he said um, they, they know that refuse collection vehicles currently service the area 
and there is no knowledge of difficulty accessing along Jubilee Terrace. Um, the, develop, the development location would not be suitable to access by large HGVs, um, but there's no reason that, you know, sort of uh, vehicles the size of the refuse collection vehicle would have trouble accessing the site. Jane? Yep. Hey, Ivor? Chair, could you define a large HGV? Is that an Arctic lorry? Because a uh, refuse collection vehicle, some of them can be triple axle. So they're quite actually big vehicles. So the sort of statement that it would limit it access, and then the next statement where access is easy anyway, so it uh, doesn't lie easily together. Mary? I don't know the size of the refuse collection that is, util that is servicing Jubilee Terrace at the moment, but I, pre there, I think the road's comments were there just to sort of give an idea of the, the size of vehicle that could get by easily. Um, uh, again, they, they hadn't commented how large an HGV would be, but I've, I would say an, an Arctic would have trouble getting up that road, so I don't think that would be... He might be able, to, or he or she might be able to describe what type of vehicle might be accessing the the, the, the respective units. Alan, sorry, Chair, just for previous experience, I think geometry would tell you, which we maybe can't see, or maybe should be adding this, but I think it's a standard ten metre radius and a six point five metre wide road would allow all sizes of HGVs along that road, and it would change accordingly. So if it's below six metres, it's it's def definitely reduced uh, access level, but I, again, it's, I'm only saying that in regards to experience, and this is the, I don't know, you kind of see the geometry is on that, so take it with a pinch of salt if you want. Thanks, Ian. Uh, James, Jim, and then Andy. Chair, it's simply a request to go back to the slide which shows the access road And you know, to add to that, you just want to slide up, Jim. Simply to give an indication of the road condition at the access. Of course, that will vary by time and depending upon what cars are sitting there at the time, because they're obviously mobile. Uh, I've got Andy. Um, thanks, Chair. It's kind of the same question because I suppose. We're not in session, so maybe I can do it later, but the proposed business is going in there. I'm, I, I can't see the delivery company sending a wee van all the way to Wickton. We have wee lot of wood. They're going to send the big lorry that delivers everywhere else. So that, that, that then doesn't sit with the road safety and access bit, because I'm looking here and, and saying seven modern size units would not generate a significant employee travel to work impact. But as a town centre location, bus, right? <laughs> um, basically, in the foot would present viable transport alternatives to, to car travel. That, that to me doesn't resonate with um, knowing that area because there are many buses a day are there down there, for example. And, uh, you know, where are the potential staff in these businesses going to come from? This is making an assumption they're all going to be within a few hundred yards so they can walk or bike. So it doesn't, it, it, it doesn't sit comfortable with me, but we may be better doing this in, when we're in session, Chair. I could rather <laughs> ask Mary to comment on that. Aye, because also the, the, the argument about it might only be small vehicles that hire the units and therefore there might never be a need for a large vehicle to travel that road. It's all speculation that we may be better no enter into the now. David McKee. Oh, it's just in the same thing. If, there, if there's delivery going there, they'll sure, surely know what the access is like and send an appropriate vehicle. If they send an Arctic and it can't get in, they either stand on the road and unload it or they take it away back and put it into a vehicle that's got access. I think we're speculating though, because the only access vehicle might be a post office van delivering mail. Uh, it depends what activity is taking place in the unit. Uh, John? 
Okay, thank you, Chair. I'm, I'm concerned about the possible noise impact, and I wondered if the, the proposed wooden screen fence will have no sound absorption qualities whatsoever. Would you consider putting a condition on to make it a, a, a more absorbent barrier than just a simple wooden fence? Mary? Uh, use class four, um, it says that the, the usage should be compatible with residential areas, and that includes the amount of noise that they make. So there shouldn't be uh, an excess um, amount of noise, uh, amount of noise that would disturb residences. Thanks, John. Jim Young. Hey, Jim McComb. Thanks, Chair. Uh, just getting back to 4.13, it's not really a town centre location. This is closer to the edge of the town. It'll be 200, 250 metres from the centre of the town. And I would think modern tradesmen are more likely to use vans rather than cycle. Again, we're speculating, but a van could traverse that road, I'm quite sure given the wood that remains there. Anyway, if we're finished speculating, members. <laughs> Ian? It's a very small point, because my understanding is that there's an existing <coughs> use there already, and if an Arctic or whatever size of vehicle want to come along, there's no restrictions on them, and ultimately that's material when it comes to the consideration of the application that's in front of us, I think. Would that be correct? Yeah. Yes. Right, members, right. We have the agent and applicant Hazel Smith and Jack Vance. You will have a joint three minutes, no three minutes each, a joint three minutes for a presentation. And then if you'd kindly remain in your seats, I'm quite sure members have some questions for you. And just whenever you're ready, and I'll remind you with 30 seconds to go to draw your presentation to a conclusion. Um, good afternoon. Uh, this land was declared surplus by the Friesland Gallery Council in August 2006. After two failed potential sales, the land was advertised in the open market in March 2007, with the latest sales particulars being prepared in April 2013. This land has been maintained by the Council for this period of time, and left unused until my offer was accepted to purchase the land in February 2016 with the aim to build industrial units for my own and other local businesses. Although being advertised as industrial land, this site doesn't form part of the designated industrial land on proposed Local Development Plan 2 for Wigtown. However, this site is part of the existing Duncan Park Industrial Estate and has a shared access. This access limits the use of land solely to industrial use. The Planning for Small to Medium Business Guide by Dumfries and Gallery Council Planning Services states the number one priority is to build the local economy and that small to medium sized businesses are vital to the growth and support of the local economy. The existing units at Duncan Park are all occupied by long term tenants. I feel there is a demand for the proposed building. After speaking with Nick Lane from Dumfries and Galloway Strategic Plot a property services, who is responsible for looking after the established industrial buildings at Duncan Park Industrial Estate, he informed me that he received between three and four inquiries per year from persons wishing to rent a unit in Wigtown. The existing units are the only allocated site in Wigtown for industrial land, with no alternatives and no marketed industrial sites in the surrounding area. I feel this site is the only option for development. After submitting initial plans, I never expected the volume of objections. I was invited to, local, to the local community council where two objectors were also present. I listened to their concerns and recommendations made from both the community council and objectors present. We worked with the community on planning to address the points highlighted and revise our drawings with, with reducing the size of development from eight units to seven, external finish of the building more in keeping with the surrounding properties, and boundary treatment, providing grass banking with the option to plant shrubs. 
lighting concerns were addressed, and most notably, restricting use from Class 5 to Class 4 and 6. You have 30 seconds to go, sir. I feel the proposed units will aid to the expansion of other local small businesses and my business with the intention of creating more jobs in the future, therefore supporting the local economy. Thank you. Thank you very much. You just remain pleased. I'm sure you'll have a number of questions. Questions for the applicant and agent. I've got Dougie and Joe McKee and Elaine and then Jim. Thank you, Chair. Um, you will have heard reference uh, to our discussion about um, vehicle access and the, the speculation, as, as, the, as the Chairman described it. But in the case officer's report, she, she makes reference to vehicle movements being self-limiting. Um, could you perhaps um, advise the committee what consideration you've given to the vehicle movements and your response to the concerns that the committee has about, you know, um, the potential impact on Jubilee Terrace and access? Uh, yes, so the units, uh, there's my own unit, which is the largest one that was proposed in the corner. Um, the largest vehicle I'll get is just a, a long wheelbase van. There's, um, I've never been trading for 10 years and I've never needed anything larger. If there's larger deliveries, there'll be two site. So, and uh, as for uh, other units, um, the actual scale of them units is pretty small. They're um, six meters by about nine. So I can't see there being a need for a, an HGV to uh, come for deliveries. It's, that's just my opinion, but um, and even then, going back to the refuge collection, it is like the standard lorry that accesses that uh, several times a week. So, and also as well, through the same access, there's farmland. So, <coughs> uh, there's a farmer travelling up there and moving cattle. So, I feel what we are proposing wouldn't be near as uh, large vehicles as what's already using that access. Thanks, Dougie. Joke McKee. Uh, mine, mine is more uh, uh, given they're talking about noise. Are, are you looking to restrict hours of operation? Um, I feel with the, uh, going back to the noise, coming under, moving it from class five to class four, that would be uh, in keeping with that. So if there was going to be people working at night, then it's obviously not going to be keeping in with class four, so it's a, I, do, I can't see that being an issue. Oh, so, well, we, we consider it here to have a look at it once we get into the session, but I was just wondering if you'd like to suggest that hours of operation for the offices, like eight to eight to seven, something like that, eight to eight, something like that. Uh, well, for myself, um, Never really be starting earlier than half six, seven o'clock. And again, generally, for myself, the two storage containers sited on the, the unit are, uh, one of them is used for running my business just now. And generally, we'll go in the morning, uh, pick things up, and generally, we don't really go back in the afternoon. But um, I think, and speaking with other local uh, trades who would be interested in units, um, their no normal like trade hours would be like seven, eight o'clock in the morning, and uh, it could be five, six o'clock at night, so. Uh, Joe, Elaine. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, because it's un un unallocated land, um, you're required to demonstrate the need for the proposal at that location, and um, the report we have indicates that you had provided anticipated occupation of the proposed units. I wondered if you could say a bit more about the interest that's been shown and the need for uh, yeah. these units to be there at, that, at this location. So I have a, I've got one a joiner who's desperate for a unit and another one who would be keen. But as for, although there wasn't any supporting cases from them trades, it's, I find it quite hard for me to have somebody supporting it within I didn't know whether it was going to get the go-ahead, because for, for me to say, oh, there's, there's going to be a unit available if you want it, but then again, if something else comes along, I couldn't say that this is definitely going to happen. So it's hard to give them that kind of that confidence to... 
mean, are you aware generally that uh, in Wigton there is a need for I feel I, I've uh, been industrial unit space, which isn't there at the moment? Uh, certainly. Uh, as for Wigton, this is the three units that exist in is the only industrial uh, land in Wigtown. Um, and the units are in six-year leases. So, and there's obviously, speaking to Nick Lane, there is interest from other parties who are phoning, asking about availability, and that there is none. So, as for alternatives, um, unless I'm going to try and move my business further towards Newton Stewart, because um, I, st I stay pretty local to Wigtown, um, and obviously there's, there is a more options than Newton Stewart, but that's not really going to aid my business and create uh, opportunities for others in the community. Thanks, Julian. Jim McComb. Thanks, Chair. Jack, you describe uh, these as units. Now, how do they compare in size with the existing units? Are they half the size or two-thirds the size? So the existing three units that are on the site are, I think they're, what are they wide? They're nine metres wide by, uh, I think it's 18 long. So my units are only going to be six by nine. So they're considerably smaller than what's there now, although uh, the height of the, the buildings, my building's slightly lower than the existing. But they are smaller units, apart from obviously my one in the, what would be was my one in the corner. And from the plan there, obviously there are a number of parking spaces. How many are actually envisaged there? I think there's okay, so there's nine uh, listed there with two disabled. Thanks, Jim. And I'll ask that we've got Andy. Thanks. I'm, <clears throat> I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the, um, the proposal about the restriction of the use of the proposed units and everything else to class four and, and use class six. I'm, if it's a, a, a store or a base for small businesses, yeah, get that. But if it's a workshop, particularly the joiner who you've already got is, I think, um, I think we kind of suggested to you, and maybe we're not the right time for saying this, but we maybe should be thinking about, you know, what kind of access, because uh, I have a joiner's yard across from my house, and it's put it into perspective, that's uh, been there for 150 years, and you kind of get to sleep some nights because it goes all night. Um, uh, so I think what I'm getting at here is, do you think, and you know, is there a way we can actually um, make sure that there's a basis for people rather than industrial workshops? That's the bit I'm getting at here. I'm looking for the case officer. That's why I'm raising it now rather than in session, right? You know, um, the workshops, you know, you say electrical tool, tools and everything else. Does that, where does that fit in terms of the legislation and what we're allowed to use white land for? Are you a case officer yeah. or the applicant? Um, well, A was to ask him, you know, what indications are you getting from the person who's already shown interest? Is, is it going to be a, a builder's workshop as well as a base? Right? And then I'll ask the okay, session. Sure. Jack will answer first and then Mary. So, um, for myself, uh, there will be odd times I've got to do repairs. But I wouldn't, for my line of work, there wouldn't be like noise. But as for a joiner, it would be a base for a store and a workshop because that would be the, the nature of his work. But I, I feel restricting uh, like noise on the units totally restricts the usage of the units because the existing units are class five that are on the existing Duncan Park. So. Um, I feel with us being class four and six, I think we'll be, we're going uh, far enough to. Mary, can that. you just answer the second part of Andy's question, please? 
Well, uh, likewise, I don't see the need to restrict the units so much um, to say that they're only for drop-offs and pickups. Um, the use class four is designed to be suitable for residential areas, so any work that goes on in there should be compatible from an amenity point of view. You've got you've got you've got four nine in your report anyway, Andy. Ah, okay. If there are no other questions for the applicant and agent, thank you for your presentation and answering the questions. If you'd like to resume your seats, please. We're now in session. Archer and then Ian. Thank the, <coughs> thanks very much, Chair. And, and, and it's not just in Wigton that we've got small and medium enterprise issues with with, with um, places for them to be in, in um, either in storage or for workshops. I think this is an opportunity for Wigton. Um, and, and therefore, I would go with the recommendations uh, in, in the report. Thanks, Archie. Ian? Thank you, Chairman. I have no difficulty with the, the application in, in general terms. I do have some concern, however, on the, the possibility of noise, uh, especially with the Class 6, with storage and distribution, when historically that could be all hours of the day or night. Uh, the, the Class 4, this is by definition, is compatible within any residential area which, again, is fine during normal business hours, but during the night, as one of our members mentioned, that keeps them awake, uh, it may cause an issue. I think it wouldn't, I wouldn't like to put any punitive conditions on it, but I think there should be some conditions on it, whether it be from uh, between the hours of 6 a.m. and 9 p.m., uh, to which would exclude during the night time. So I, I would suggest that as, a, as a, an amendment, if there's a... A proposal to, to go ahead. We'll, we'll, we'll try and tidy that up when all members are finished speaking. Ian, uh, Jane. Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, I was actually going to second Councillor Driver's motion, um, please, to accept it as per recommendation. Um, I, I would ur urge members to realise that um, Class 4 is restrictive in itself. And, um, and I, I would also urge members to realise that if we do restrict uh, to certain hours, it, it really does make life much more difficult for small businesses. And I think that's exactly what we are trying not to do with respect to our, our, um, our overall policies. We want to help the economy to grow. Um, mem people in, in these small units should not be doing anything to make life difficult for their neighbours. And we are making certain through making it class four and class six, that they can't do that. So um, I'm perfectly accept, uh, willing to accept the recommendations as they stand. There's also the issue, of course, or, 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 or the the ability to enforce any conditions that we apply. I've got, I've had you, you know, come back to you. I've got Jim McComb. Thank you, Chair. I would echo Councillor Driver's comment that this is the only place such business could be carried out in Wigtown under the current LDP. So the applicant really has very little choice in the matter. And the second point, if this is class four and class six, by definition, the activities here have to be compatible with residential areas. Okay, I presume Ian's wanting to put an amendment in, so I've got Ian Carruthers first, who might be wanting to do something to support you, and then I'll come to you, Ian. I'm just being quite black and white in this. I listen to what everybody's saying. I'm, I'm leaning towards the recommendations put forward within the report and council drivers put forward. I think it's been supported by a few because I've come across this quite quite a number of times where you have the environmental uh, standards officer out and so on and so forth. So I don't see the, those conditions. I suppose what I really need clarity on. I mean, in real terms, I think I'm supporting it as per the recommendations. But what does that uh, recommendation, condition five in, in the recommendations, what it says? And it talks about none of the units here by grant permission shall be used for any purposes other than for purposes uh, falling within classes four and six. So I take it that's four, five, and six, uh, would, it would have to comply with it. it just, it's really about this particular, uh, as it stands, I think it, it can, could be used for or, or accessed 24 hours a day. And it's about the noise issues, I think, in particular, and uh, having a, an adverse effect on the local environment. If it was to be, say, a, almost like a, a joiner's workshop stroke sawmill working 24 hours a day, I can <laughs> completely agree that wouldn't be the case. But I wouldn't have thought that would be the case in regards to condition number five, 
if we could just get that clarified. Going back, I think it's very much we should be supporting the local economy wherever we can. I'll ask David to deal with that, and then we'll come to Ian. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, just for clarity, that on page 94, it's making it clear it could only be used for uses within Class 4 or 6. So in other words, a, a business use or storage and distribution. I would accept the, the point that Councillor Blake is making. Certainly the Class 4 ones are self-regulating and you can't, by definition, have it as a sawmill that's operating 24 hours a day and causing a nuisance. It's therefore a change of use. It's moved to general industrial class 5 if it is that, and there are obviously other uh, statutory noise nuisance issues which could be brought into play. So the class 4 units don't cause me any concern. The only one which maybe is at the back of my mind is a class 6 unit doesn't have the same restriction as class 4. So technically, you could have people using it for storage and coming in and out at all times of the day and night and not be breaching it. Uh, any inherent use class um, condition, if you like. But if you do, um, to come back to what Councillor Maitland was saying, if you do attach a condition about hours of operation, you can do that. Um, there are the six tests that are set out on the front page of your agenda um, under four, where it says a condition must be necessary relevant to planning, relevant to the development to be permitted, enforceable, precise, and re reasonable in all other respects. The two I would query there is, is it really necessary? That's a matter for yourselves. If you feel it is necessary, then you, you have the power to attach that. The enforceable one, as the Chair mentioned earlier, is probably the one that does cause me some concerns. And really, this was kind of addressed at the bottom of paragraph 4.8. It will restrict the use and the chances of us actually being able to, to carry out Enforcement action against it are probably limited if you attach that condition, but uh, basically it's open to yourself is what I'm saying, that you can attach that condition if you feel it's necessary. Yeah, Ian, Ian Blake. Thank you, Chairman. If I can start off by just clarifying a point, uh, I think Councillor Maitland mentioned about restricting it to seven hours. I was actually suggesting restricting it to 15 hours, uh, the hours of operation between 6 a.m. and 9 PM, uh, just to clarify that. I still feel that, that there should be some, if, if it's not going to be punitive, but I think it's unlikely, I still think it would prevent anything happening in the future. So I would like to, to propose the motion that we do impose that uh, that condition, that it's only for use between 6 a.m. and 9 p.m. I'm not protective about the 9 p.m. If other members think 10 p.m. is fair, uh, that would be fine. But I would certainly go ahead on that just now, 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. So is that an amendment to the proposal? It's an amendment to the proposal. Or, or, or a con, an additional condition? Yeah, I, 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 would, I would agree to approve, uh, to approve the application, but with that additional, out an additional yeah. condition. Thanks for that. Okay. Is there anyone prepared to second, Ian? Hey, I would say if we moved it to 10 at night. The use is restricted from 6 a.m. in the morning to 10 at night. So we've got that actually. Do you want to come back in? Do you have a motion already in? Please? I have a motion. I'll go, I'll go with the motion, Chair. Let's just go to the vote. And Jane, you? Well, the honest issue is I will certainly go with the motion. Um, the fact is there is absolutely nothing to stop anybody going around there and kind of manoeuvring at night. There's nothing, absolutely nothing that could stop them from doing that. So, so it, 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 you know, just, just literally just going and driving around. So, I mean, I, th I think it's unreasonable. Don't know how many the vote will, like there is in Wigton here. Oh. The vote will determine it. We'll, we'll, we'll go to the vote. Just remind members of what the amendment, uh, and uh, sorry, the motion and the amendment is, Nick, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, the motion proposed by Councillor Driver, seconded by Councillor Maitman, Maitland, is to agree the proposal as per the recommendations in the report. The amendment proposed by Councillor Blake, seconded by Councillor James, is to agree the proposal um, as per the recommendations, but with a, a with an additional condition which would restrict the operation of the development between the hours of 6 a.m. and 10 p.m. Okay. Um, Councillor Dempster. Motion. Councillor Campbell. Motion. Councillor Blake. Amendment. Councillor Doogie Campbell. Motion. Councillor Carruthers. Motion. Councillor Driver. 
Motion. Councillor Ferguson. Amendment. Councillor Juicy. Motion. Councillor Hislop. Councillor James. Amendment. Councillor Lever. Motion. Councillor Maitland. Motion. Councillor McComb. Amendment. Councillor McKee. Motion. Councillor Murray. Motion. Councillor Tate. And Councillor Young. Amendment. Okay, so um, we have 11 members voting in favour of the motion, five voting in favour of the amendment, therefore the motion is carried and the application is agreed as per the recommendations. Thank you, Nick. We move on to agenda item number seven, planning application for the direction of wind turbine up to 36.6 metres to hub height and 48.8 metres to blade tip and associated infrastructure at land northwest of Castlewig Farm, Whithorn. The application is a full planning permission. The recommendation is to refuse. The reference number is 15 slash forward slash p forward slash one forward slash zero one one three and the case officer is billy murray billy will you take us through your presentation when you're ready please yes thank you chair <coughs> excuse me thank you chair this is an application for a 48.8 high meter wind turbine uh, at castlewig farm north of whithorn uh, before i go on there's one typographical error to correct uh, in paragraph one two uh, the site is 4.3 kilometres northwest of Whithorn, not 43 kilometres northwest of Whithorn. Apologies for that. Okay, I'll just take you through the slides. Um, this is the location plan. Uh, as I say, it's 4.3 kilometres northwest of Whithorn. Um, that's a closer in location plan showing the site of the turbine, which is the small square at the left and the route of the, the access track that would be formed to access the turbine site. Um, that's an aerial view of the area surrounding the site and the site itself. Um, these are views of the site at ground level. That's the site looking from the south. Uh, the site's in, in, in a larger field enclosure on a, sorry, on a slightly elevated position. That's from the east. That's from the site. So I'm standing on the site there. So it's on a slightly elevated position, more or less in the center of that field. Uh, the woodland that you see on the right in that view is mentioned in the report. Um, that is designated as ancient woodland and it also forms part of the Castlewig uh, non-inventory designed landscape. Uh, that's a clearer view of the woodland, which is about 110 to 120 meters from the proposed turbine. Again, this is east from the site looking towards that woodland. I'm more or less standing on the point where the turbine would be This is looking southeast from the site. That's the end of the pocket of woodland I mentioned earlier. And that's due south. Southwest. West. And that's back to the beginning. So I've taken views 360 degrees while standing on the turbine position. Uh, these are the plans submitted with the application. Uh, this is the location plan. The blue just shows the other land in the applicant's control. Uh, so the red dot is the lo proposed location of the turbine. Um, that's the site plan, again, showing the access track and the turbine position itself. Closer view again uh, in terms of the site plan, a higher, uh, a, a larger scale. This is the proposed turbine elevations. 
It's a conventional wind turbine, three blade of that height. Sorry, I'm working on a hair trigger here today. That's, these are photo montages submitted with the application. That's viewpoint three. That's from the south looking towards uh, the turbine and showing uh, how it would be positioned and how it would look in that view. The woodland on the right, as I mentioned earlier, is the designated woodland. This is, apologies for the quality of the submissions, but that's not in our hands. So this is uh, from a viewpoint, viewpoint nine, that you can just about see the turbine above the tree line. Uh, it's in silhouette in that view. This is another viewpoint. As is that. This is the viewpoint map, map that was submitted uh, with the application. Going through it in great detail at the time I was writing the report, there are some discrepancies in that, so apologies for that. Because of that, I've been unable to identify precise locations for some of the, the photo montages I've just shown. Uh, and also, as I mentioned, there are of rather poor quality in any event. These were additional viewpoints that were requested uh, mainly by the archaeologist. If you look at the archaeologist's initial uh, comments, he indicated that he felt, first of all, that better images were required and that some additional images were required. This is the summary of this, the zone of visual influence uh, showing the green shows uh, theoretical visibility of the turbine in all of the green areas, so it's quite widely, widely spread uh, over the Machers Peninsula. So the recommendation is to reprove, uh, uh, refuse the application for three key reasons, adverse impacts on landscape and visual, uh, adverse impacts in terms of design, in term, to the extent that the design is not seen as compatible uh, with the area in the context of the site, uh, and adverse impacts on the historic environment uh, with particular regard to the, scheduled, the setting of the scheduled ancient monument to the south and the setting of the historic woodland, which is also designated as a non-inventory designed landscape. So the recommendation is to refuse for these reasons. Thank you, Billy. Questions for the case officer? Members? Elaine? I, th I think it's probably just a slightly more general issue, actually. It seems a little bit illogical that when, I mean, this has been brought to us because more than at least six people have objected uh, and believe it should be refused, but uh, also planning officials believe it, that, that it should be refused. So I'm not quite sure why it's not being refused under delegated powers, con considering that the planning officers agree with the objectors that it should be refused. David? That, I'm afraid, is our scheme of delegation, is that if there are more than six objectors, then it has to come before committee, because I think it was considered at the time that that indicated that there was a, a genuine community interest in it, and yeah. members, therefore, uh, had an interest. Uh, do you not feel that's a little illogical, though, if the planning officers actually agree with the community that uh, the application is inappropriate? I don't agree with you, Elaine, <laughs> but, but we are where we are. But if there are no questions for the Jim McComb. Thanks, Chair. Billy, can you confirm that this proposal would be the highest turbine in the southern Machers by some considerable distance? Billy? Yes, I can confirm that. There is one uh, turbine at the old station at Garleston, which is in the order of 29 metres. Uh, there are two turbines uh, near Whop Hill, which are in the order of 30, 35 metres. These are the three tallest turbines uh, in the Marcus Peninsula at the moment, in the whole Marcus Peninsula at the moment. So the answer is yes, it would be the highest by some distance. Thanks, Jim. Andy? Thank you, thanks. Um, good morning, Billy. Um, I'm looking at page 100, 152. LDP policy HE6 um, in relation to design landscapes requiring developers to submit assessment of impact under settings plus details of any proposed mitigation methods. No such assessment has been undertaken. 
a, a bit like Elaine, that kind of procedural thing here is, why is it even accepted then? Should it not be sent back and say it's incomplete? Billy? Mm, I take your point, but it's considered there's, there's sufficient information to determine the application. Thanks, Andy. Okay. If there are no other members, I had a list of five objectors, a, I think three can attend, so we have two objectors that want to speak to committee and they're going to read, I think, a statement from the other three. So we will ask questions of the objectors on their statements, but we can't on, on the written submissions by third parties. So if Anne Brown would like to come forward first, please, you will have three minutes, Anne for your personal presentation. Do you want to do that first before the letters are read out, or do you want to do the letters first? Um, I will do my own uh, first, and then I'll do that of Mervyn Crew, um, and then I'll hand over to my friend and neighbour Jack, who'll do that, his own and the other two. That's perfect. In that case, for your own personal presentation, you'll be limited to three minutes. Mm -hmm. I'll remind you with 30 seconds to go to draw your presentation to a conclusion. Members might want to ask you questions, and then after that's concluded, I'll ask you to read the, the representation you have on for the Mervyn, third party. Yeah. Okay, thank thank you. you. Just whenever you're ready, Anne. Okay, thank you. Um, hello, I'm Anne Brown, and I live at Castlewig Lodge. Um, I'm very, I consider myself to be very lucky to live on the Maccas Peninsula. I chose to live here uh, because of the unique landscape, the historic environment, and the peace and quiet. Uh, I provide bed and breakfast to visitors to the area from my home, Castlewig Lodge, which is a listed building. Some of my visitors are returning guests. They come back year after year, and they always remark on what a special, beautiful, and peaceful place Castlewig is. The sighting of the proposed wind turbine would, had, would have a negative impact on the setting of our historic house, uh, and, and also on the setting of the scheduled monument at Castlewig and the other listed buildings there and the surrounding natural landscape and could negatively affect tourism and, of course, my B&B business. People are putting a great deal of creative energy to improve recreational facilities for people who live here and to encourage people to come and visit this remarkable area and Whitton in particular and I have been pleased to be involved in some of these uh, initiatives, for example, the recent Festival of Museums weekend in Whithorn. Um, the proposed turbine would be visible along the main route into Whithorn and, of course, to my house and would have a negative impact on people making that journey and could counteract all the good work which is presently being done to encourage visitors to the area. Thank you. Do any members have any questions for Anne and her presentation? In that case, if you'd like to read the first of the representations, please, that would be great, Anne. Thank you. Okay. So this is from Mervyn and Brenda Crew, who live at Marl Park Cottage, Castlewig. The committee will have read the many objections, including my own, made about this proposal concerning its effect on the natural environment, tourism, and the general quality of life of people living in this area. My plea to the committee at this stage is to avoid setting two dreadful precedents that approval would create. Firstly, for a turbine of this size to be built in the Maccas at all, with the encouragement to other landowners that approval would give. Secondly, for anyone to be allowed in any part of Dumfries and Galloway to blight the lives of other people by building a turbine of this size so near to that other person's house, and I refer, of course, to Sorby Lodge. This sort of behaviour is a total disgrace and should surely be resisted by all of us as a community. Thank you. Thanks very much, Anne. If you'd like to resume your seat, mm -hmm. thanks for your presentation. Uh, we now have Jack Norgate. Jack, if you'd like to come forward, please. Do you follow the same process? You'll do your own presentation first. Members want to ask questions, then you can do the other two representations after that. Uh, good afternoon. I was going to read the representations first and then leave my tool. Be to my guest, that's, that's fine. Okay. So you understand, we won't ask any questions of the representations, and when uh -huh. you've done that, your presentation will last three minutes. Yep. 
And then you may want to remain in your seat in case members have questions for you. Thank you. Whenever you're ready, sir. Thank you. Um, the two representations are from Alistair and Elizabeth Vance at uh, Bridge House Farm and also from Nadia Gwynne at Castlewig Farm. They all extend their apologies to committee for not being able to represent themselves this morning. Mrs Vance writes, with reference to the above proposal, I wish to highlight my concerns of the impact on the surrounding dwelling properties, rural scenic area and the impact on tourism in the area, especially the historic borough of Whitorn. We live and work on the neighbouring farm and throughout most of the year we have cattle grazing on the fields within very close proximity of the site uh, over the dike. Our cows give birth in these fields and I feel the noise of construction of such a windmill and once it's erected the noise would be very disturbing to the young animals. I would ask that a survey is done with regards to bats in and around the area as our farmhouse and outbuildings of a colony of them. I would be very surprised if they are not in and around the trees situated near the site. Although I am aware of the loss of view is not one of your key factors or considerations, the view from my garden and living room window look out towards the proposed site. It is the only view which our family gets from our property as we are surrounded by trees on all of the sides of the property. I feel that it is very unfair as the applicant does not live near the site so will not be bothered by any of the disruption or noise. There would be no financial benefit to the community whatsoever, and the applicant would be the only one with financial gain. I would ask that this proposal is refused, as if, as if this was given the go-ahead, it opens the chance of many more turbines being erected throughout the Macca's area, which would be catastrophic to the area's tourism trade. Thank you. And from Nadia Gwynne at Castlewig Farm, my objection to the proposed wind turbine at uh, land northwest of Castlewig Farm reference 15 stroke P stroke 10013 is the turbine would be an eyesore and a blight on the landscape, standing at 159 feet to the tip. This is only 10 feet smaller than Nelson's column. The visual and noise impact upon myself and my neighbours would be very detrimental. I also worry that if this application is granted, it would set a precedent uh, of turbines of this size in this beautiful area. How do you go in? Thank you. Well, you're on when you're ready, sir, and you'll have three minutes with a 30-second reminder just to draw your presentation to a conclusion. Thank you. My name is Jack Norgate. I reside at Sorby Lodge on the old Castlewig estate. Since I raised my initial objections to the application, certain amendments have been made. For example, the noise level assessment for my property and distance from the proposed construction site, which were omitted on the original specification, have now been included, showing that my property is 248 metres from the construction site and that the noise level assessment is 33.9 decibels, this falling just inside the permitted 35 decibel limit. I respectfully suggest that this noise level assessment is at best not independent. My property stands alone in its own grounds and it is a very quiet and peaceful place to live. The noise from this turbine will cause great disturbance to me and my family. My wife is employed by the Scottish Ambulance Service. She is required to work shifts, days and nights. It is imperative that she gets good sound rest in order for her to carry out her emergency duties, both as an ambulance driver and patient attendant. The proposed application, if successful, will greatly interfere with her rest and sleep patterns. The proposed sighting of this turbine is just northwest of Sorby Lodge. The wind blows from the northwest on a regular basis and will carry the noise from the turbine to us at a much greater sound level than that estimated. Should this application be successful, it will set a precedent for other turbines to be installed, which will have a catastrophic consequence for me and the local area. This application is a totally unnecessary venture with no benefit to the immediate area or further beyond, except for the financial interest of the applicant who resides at least four miles from the proposed site, thereby having no detrimental effect on his home, his family or his way of life. While, while I understand that potential property devaluation is not considered as a reason to refuse an application, I have to submit that this will affect the value of my property while swelling the bank account of the applicant. Thank you. Thank you and thanks for your time. Any member of the committee have any questions for the gentleman? In that case, sir, if you'd like to resume your seat, thank you very much. Members for in session, Archie, and then Elaine. Sure, I'm surprised that the applicant isn't here, um, uh, but I think from, from 
what I've seen and what I've heard, I think we need to go with the recommendations on this one. Elaine? No, I, my point entirely is I think this is an inappropriate application and uh, we should go with the recommendation. So I'll second Councillor John Hibbert's motion. Thanks, Elaine. Andy? Um, totally agree. And um, I, I made my, my, my view clear earlier. Um, I don't know if it needs to, the scheme of delegation needs to be looked at or whatever, but if it's not compliant with the requirements of the HDP, uh, uh, the LDP, we should, it's not, you know, should we consider it as a valid application? Um, and I think maybe a bit, a bit more stringent. There's a lot of man hours and you know, people hours and committee hours and everything else going into this, um, and they've no completed what they need to complete. If that's the view of the committee, I can ask David to convey that message back. The view of the committee, David. Uh, Maybe just to clarify, there is a minimum requirement to make an application valid, uh, which is a, a relatively low threshold. Uh, therefore, we have to accept the application. It's whether or not it's got enough information to allow us to properly determine it. In this particular instance, um, Billy could probably give more information on this, but as I understand it, you'll note it's a 2015 application. We had tried to get um, adequate levels of information uh, for some time and then tried to, because that was, it was really not going to be one we could support, tried to get the applicant to withdraw it and they refused to, which is why ultimately we've had to bring it to committee just to bring it to an end. Thanks, Andy. That was a slight digression. So we have a proposal from March, seconded by Elaine, to go with the officer recommendation. Are there any alternative proposals? In that case, it's a unanimous decision. Nick? Yep, the decision is to refuse as per the reasons set out in the report. Thank you. We will come to agenda item number eight, erection of detached garden room retrospective at Kirk Style, 4 Main Street, Dalry, Castle Douglas. The application type is a full application. The recommendation is to approve subject condition. The reference number is 18 stroke 0580 stroke full. And the case officer is Oh, it's, no, it's Iona. No, it's Jessica. It's Jessica, <laughs> Jessica, of course it is. My goodness, uh, Jessica Taylor. Jessica, will you take us through your presentation, please? Thank you, Chair. Uh, so Far Main Street um, is a traditional dwelling house located uh, on the Main Street. There is a mixture of um, buildings around the dwelling. To the northwest is the church. Uh, to the northeast is the village hall. Um, to the northeast of the uh, the actual dwelling itself is either residential property number six. Um, the garden room um, is a timber construction measuring approximately 8.2 metres by 5.6 metres uh, with approximate height of 3.5 metres. Uh, the garden ground does slope uh, upwards at the rear of the property, so the garden room is in an is in elevated position. Um, to the front, you'll see there's a decked area which has stairs down onto the lower area of, of garden. Taking through some photographs, so this is the view from inside the garden of the garden room. Again from within the application site, it's showing the decking and the stairs down. Uh, another photo from within the site, um, you'll note there was a objection regarding overlooking to the neighbouring site. Um, the, app, the garden, the applicant's garden does do a dog leg, so it does go behind the, the number six. Um, and that window on the right hand side is the one that um, faces that boundary. But there is approximately 21 metres between that window um, on the right and the back of the neighbouring property. Again, just some more views. And this was taken from the uh, hall. Um, overlooking the site, so that's the roof of the, the garden. Um, I think the thing with this is the concerns have been raised by the community council and objectors regarding um, the use of the building. Um, and I think I'll draw members' attention to 4.9 of the report, which addresses the matter. A domestic structure in a domestic garden um, is not usually considered to be a uh, create a land use conflict. Um, Antisocial levels of noise that may come from the garden room is not a matter which the planning authority can control or take into consideration. A person using the garden room to produce music could potentially create the same amount of noise in their garden or in the main house. 
um, and there is other routes that to deal with potential noise issues under separate legislation. Um, the application is recommended for approval with the standard condition regarding the garden room being for domestic use. Thank you, Jessica. Members, questions for case officer? Dougie? Thanks, Chair. Um, it, it's clear from the, the papers that there is uh, some dispute as to the intended uh, use of the the, the, the structure. Um, and I'm interested to know, uh, uh, case officers visit to the location, whether uh, it, the, the, it was considered to be a garden room or whether it was uh, had the appearance of a, a music studio. And I'm also interested in the, the condition that's been recommended in relation to um, no uh, commercial um, uh, relation to the, the music um, from the location. Um, I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm unclear. Perhaps explain that condition in a wee bit more detail, because the objections that, that are in the papers appear to be in relation to noise levels, um, and I'm wondering why it's, it's, it's been made specifically relevant to commercial uh, use. Thanks, Jessica. Um, I wasn't the case officer, so I can't comment on the site visit, but um, in usual circumstances, there wouldn't be any reason in a case like this for the site or the officer to actually go inside the, the room itself, so they would just see what the photograph she's taken on the site is, is what you've shown today. Um, in terms of the standard condition, it is a standard condition we attach to um, separate outbuildings within domestic gardens to ensure that they aren't used for any purpose other than ancillary to the main house. It is a standard condition that we use, for example, on garages when they're detached so that you don't have them repairing motor vehicles. So it's not something that we've um, specifically, we've added it to this, but it's, it is a standard condition we, we have used on other developments. I'll get David to come for an additional bit of information if you want, Doug, because we had, we had a discussion about that earlier today. David, can you help Doug with that? The, the material difference here is if that was being operated as a commercial recording studio where you were encouraging people to come in and use that facility in exchange for money, then that becomes a completely different use. If, like me, you're a sad person who owns lots of guitars and sits at home and plays and does quite a lot of recording and writing and stuff like that, then this would be perfect. I would love one of these, but um, I don't. I certainly don't make any money out of it. I'll probably get refused, yeah, I know. Uh, so I think that's the difference. It's if you are using this because it is ancillary to your use as a, a domestic dwelling house, as your own house, um, and that can even have friends coming around and playing things as well, which is what we understand they probably are using it for but they're not using it as a commercial recording studio. It's ancillary to the use of the dwelling house. So it would actually comply with the terms of the condition. As Jessica was saying before, if they are then making uh, antisocial noise in there, there are other ways and means of dealing with it. But really the key paragraph, as uh, was alluded to, is paragraph 4.9. There's no inherent land use conflict about a garden shed in a domestic garden. Dougie, I've got Dougie, Elaine, Joke, and then Andy. Okay, if, if I could uh, just come back on that, um, th there's been reference to uh, being used as a recording studio, um, but the, the condition only makes reference to commercial use. Therefore, would, for example, um, the shed being used for music lessons, where people were paying for lessons, would that be in conflict with the condition as it is laid out? And I'm assuming, you know, uh, from what you're saying, is if, if it was a gathering of people with guitars in the room, and maybe you would be there, David. I don't know, but um, would would that clearly that would not be in conflict? But um, it's just this um, clarification, please, on if it was lessons that were being provided, David. It's always a matter of fact and degree on that one. You get a lot of people who are, say, piano teachers at their home, and. That is how they make their living, but on a fact and degree basis, it's still predominantly a residential property. My view in this case is if this was a fully operational commercial studio where it was being advertised online or in newspapers as that, that's, a, that's clearly a breach. If it is something where people are sitting down playing guitars and um, even then just recording that for their own 
amusement for their own benefit, then that's ancillary to the dwelling house. It's where it then becomes a commercial facility of using it's being advertised and encouraging people to go there and use it and money changes hands. That's where it's a, a change of use. Thank you. Do you get Elaine? I, I guess the thing that slightly concerns me, and it's not really a material planning consideration probably, is that the construction of a garden room, a garden shed, might not be as uh, suitable for that type of activity and that it wouldn't be soundproofed in the way in, in which a room within a, a property might be soundproofed and therefore pr produce more n nuisance to neighbours. I, I, I don't know that that's actually reflected in any way in, in planning policy, but I'm slightly uncomfortable about the idea that you could go and play a load of guitars in your garden shed and people would have to sort of, you know, that unless somebody called the police, that that, that would be perfectly acceptable. And probably that would happen, Elaine, it would be another a, a agency that would deal with that. David, do you want to add anything? Uh, yes, I mean, I, I would echo your concern. Certainly, if it were to be a commercial recording studio where it was going to be used on a, a regular noise-intensive basis, you would expect it to be properly noise-insulated for that very reason. But as a dwelling house, there'd be nothing to stop people actually setting up the band like the Beatles did on the, the roof of Abbey Studios and setting up in the garden and playing, and that would... It would not be a planning issue. Thanks, Elaine. Joe? I have great difficulty accepting this as a, a garden room. It's a house. <laughs> <laughs> There's nobody builds a shed that size and to that standard without having other ulterior motives, if you like. And I think there's one big con going on here. I've, I've, can, I'm, I'm being, being serious, like, I'm no, I can it's a bit, of, a bit of a joke, but I think it's a big con. The size of it is just not, I can't see how you could justify building a shed that size. I look at the state of the garden, I don't think there's access in for a, a car to, to park a car into the garage or even anything like that. And I, I've grave doubts about what this is actually being built for. I wish I'd have said that size for my cars, but aye, uh, we, we, we are where we are. We have an application before us and, and we accept, we have to accept what's said in the application because that's what the applicant says it's to be used for. Andy? Thanks. Um, uh, thanks for putting that up. That's, uh, I was actually going to ask you to put up the, the one that shows further afield. How far is that actually from their own property? Right. The sighting of it, it's interesting, it's been put right against the adjoining property and some considerable distance away from where they, where they, they actually stay. And it's, I, I echo Jock's view, it's hardly a huffy, huffy bed at the bottom of the garden. Do you know, that, that's a substantial building that's been put there and now they're coming back wanting planning permission in, in retrospect. So I, I've got grave reservations actually what, the, what, what this is about and whether this should actually be allowed to happen. Because if we do that there, I mean, where is their house hey, on that map? Where do they live? Hey, number, absolutely. Right. It couldn't be any further away from their house. So they're obviously, or the, the other half of the house is obviously worried about the noise coming out there, or it would be right down the back of their house. Really Maybe they don't like music, but the thing about it is, we, we, we're not here to look at the building, that, that's where it is. And you can see there's a, there's a brick structure there that's probably been used as a part of the means of, of, of supporting that. But that's a thing for you go for you in session, Andy. I've got Jane. Um, <clears throat> thanks. Um, the, the Beatles' farewell rooftop concert <laughs> only lasted as long as the authorities couldn't find them. Um, can I, can I be, be, look, this is retrospective, and the question is, would we have agreed to this had it come to us in this format? I mean, that, that's really, I think, the question we have to ask ourselves. Um, well, still that question's for the officer here. Yeah? Yes, it is. It is a question. Would we have done that? You no, know, it is a direct question. Would we have done that? Well, that's not the case. Officer Jessica, can you answer that? Ian? David will do it. Short answer is I can't see why not. I mean, if that was a garden room where somebody was only going to be reading, writing, doing painting, storing their, um, their lawnmower, stuff like this. 
would we really have had justification planning terms to refuse it? We think not. We're recommending approval subject to condition. That's a row, Jane, for you. <laughs> <laughs> you get a lecture for David there. Uh, Ian Carruthers. Jim, I, just, I mean, I think that's a quite a good question in regards to what Jane put there. I, 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 my own thoughts is quite open in regards to that. Would we, would we not? But something like this I've come across with my own trade is, is that the potential fire hazard. I don't know that's kind of slipping into building standards, but I still think, from a planner perspective, is a timber building like that as close proximity to another building? Uh, I don't know if it's been fireproof. If it had been, it, it kind of timber may have been fireproofed, it may not. And in real terms, normally, wouldn't you be able to build that close uh, with a timber building next to a boundary in another building? Just, unless yes, we knew can. it was fire treated and all the rest of it. And that's something I don't know. The soundproof, and we've got environmental standards officers and such like they could address that if it became a problem. But I don't know how we retrospectively cover the, the building standards side. I know we're sitting here as a plan application, but I still think it's relevant. Jessica, fire safety. And David's day. Uh, well, basically, it's not far off permitted development rights that you could actually have a shed in that location of timber construction uh, right on the boundary, and we would have no planning control on it. So you're right, it falls into other um, domains. But in planning terms, the combustibility of it is not an issue we can look at. Jim McComb, uh, Ivor, and then David, and hopefully we'll can hope and ruin everybody by then. Thank you, Chair. Looking at the photographs, this is a structure which is 27 feet long and 18 and a half feet wide. T to me, that is a holiday lodge, not a shed, certainly. We're at questions for the case officer at the moment, Jim. Right, okay, Chair. I take your I hope point. the next two are questions I for the case point. officer. Okay. Iva. Chair, just wondering if the condition is necessary and is it enforceable? Uh, I could give you an example of one that we did many years ago next to my mother's house where there was a garage put in place. It was for uh, the same sort of thing where it was for the, how is it to say, the enjoyment of the dwelling house. And there was cars in and out of there every day, and uh, nobody bothered to actually uh, enforce anything. So is this actual condition enforceable uh, in the way it's written? It's a question, David. Yes and yes. Will it be? Well, David said yes. <laughs> David, and then Elaine. Um, yes, it's 46 uh, square metres, eight, 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 about five and a half or so. Um, what's the threshold for permitted development? How big can a shed be? Jessica? Uh, it's hard to answer that one because it can be up to, uh, it, there's no restraints on, in terms of um, the square metrage of it. it. It's where it is in the garden um, and how far it is away from the boundary and the height of it. So um, it, it can have a structure that's um, very large if it meets the other requirements in terms of the distances away from boundaries and, and the height. So you can get an, a, a substantial um, structure. It also applies on 50% of the garden. And this garden in this case is a large garden. Yeah, yes. So you can do up to 50% of your garden, and in this case it is a large garden. It has to be one metre away from the boundary, and I'm testing it four metres in height. Three. Good. We've got Elaine and then John Young. I'm just following on from Councillor McComb's question. I just wondered what's inside this building. Does it have services, for example? Is there a toilet or a sink or anything like that inside it? No need it, maybe. Eh... Uh, I, I don't believe... Oh, they're not applying for that. It's no consideration. Hey, John Young. I, I actually thought a garden room was a, a, a building without services. And as soon as you put toilet facilities, cooking facilities, a shower, for instance, and it no longer was classified as a garden room, it became a cabin. You get the layout, Jessica? Doors and windows in a raised deck. Yeah, I'm not aware of there being any services in it. Um, it is separated into two compartments. 
um, but I'm not aware of any services. And uh, actually, it's a question. Um, does the, the house that owns the land that this is built on, is it a listed building? No. 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 And the follow on from that, is it part of um, one of the village conservation areas? Jessica? No. No. So if we have exhausted Jessica and exhausted questions for the officer, we have listed speakers. We have James Hutchison as an objector, no present. And we have Mark Stoves on behalf of the applicant. Could you just check, Tracy, to make sure there's nobody? He said he wasn't going to be here. He wasn't going to be here. What about the Mark Stoves? He wasn't. Coming, okay. So in that case, we are in session, members. Archie? Chair, under planning terms, of course, there's really not anything we can do about this. Um, and, and the the recommendation, the decision to prove subject to the conditions covers everything that's actually in it, unfortunately, much as you'd like to have seen it refused. But we can't, I can't see any planning reason for that to be refused, so therefore it's to go with the recommendation. Okay, and John Campbell seconded that. Uh, Andrew? Sorry, I was just coming in. I was going to say the exact same as Archie. Being honest, we can speculate what we think can go in it and all this. But as long as they're legally using it, as long as it's within social powers, etc., and as long as there's no trading standards violations, as it being used as a commercial property, we've got no way that we can refuse this. So I would suggest we go with the recommendation. Okay, Andrew, that's so far. Elaine? I, just, I suppose just for, for some sort of clarification, I mean, in to some extent, I would like to be able to refuse it, but I also can't see the reasons why we would refuse it. What sort of inspection is there to ensure that they're not using this in some other way, either for as a commercial studio or indeed using it as some sort of holiday lodge or whatever? We don't have an inspection regime. We respond to complaints, Elaine, and yes, uh, it would be another department, department that, would, that would deal with that, but it would certainly be dealt with, and if it came to David, he would refer it to the appropriate agency, wouldn't you? Well, well there'll be two aspects. Um, obviously, if there were complaints about noise, antisocial behaviour, then that's set out in paragraph 4.9 what the options are there. If it's approved and subject to the condition, then it is something that I'm sure neighbours would alert us to very quickly with uh, copies of internet adverts or whatever as a commercial studio on that stage, we would uh, clearly be able to challenge it uh, and request either an application for a change of use or that the activity cease. Thanks, Elaine. Do uh, um, Thank you. Um, just following on from the, the, the planning enforcement element of it, it I mean, it's clear from a, a correspondence I think members all received um, yesterday, I think it was, that there's a Facebook page advertising this particular shed as a, a music studio. So my question is, with the, the condition that is being proposed, would planning enforcement officers be entitled to actually enter this garden room to see what's inside? Uh, or is it going to be the same as the planning process that they can only look at the outside of the, the, the structure? Well, luckily Jess Jessica's the enforcement officer, so <laughs> Jessica will tell you. Yes, we, we can uh, then find out the use uh, uh, go inside. We have to, because it's a domestic property, give notice for that visit. Um, but I think in this case it will be quite clear uh, if it was being used um, for commercial business by, by the fact that of the Facebook page and uh, other uh, the, the usage and people coming and choosing from. Okay, so so far we have a proposal from Archie seconded by John. If there are no alternative proposals, go with the recommendation a unanimous decision, Nick. Yep, so the, the decision is to approve subject to conditions set out in the report. Okay, John Young's about to leave us. We come to agenda item number nine. Application for change of use of first and second floor offices to dwelling at 92 King Street, Castle Douglas. Application types, full application. Uh, the recommendation is to approve unconditionally. Reference number is 18 forward slash 
213 forward slash full. Case officer list, instance David Sutte. And David, just when you're ready to take us through your presentation, please. Thank you, Chair. Just standing in for your owner today. Um, this is a property on uh, King Street in Castle Douglas, just on the corners. You'll see, those who probably know it, is Post Horn 90, and this involves the uh, first and second floor above the retail unit. The application is obviously only before yourselves because of who the applicant is. In other terms, in planning terms, it's fully acceptable and indeed uh, to be encouraged if you're bringing a vacant unit into use. Uh, the entry is there, you can see in the, the centre, you, you go through there and then to the upper two floors. That's uh, just the first floor plan. And this is over the, the two floors, so you can see it, it would fairly readily allow itself to be converted back into residential use. The, on the, the second floor is already a bathroom and uh, there's a kitchen there as well. So I say it's uh, really just because of who the applicant is, it's before you, but recommendation is to approve. Questions for the case officer, Elaine and then Archie? Questions for the case officer, I? I don't know if it's really a question, actually, all I was, it was an observation that this would appear to be in accordance with the council's desire to uh, have people living in town centres again, so that's probably not a question. Maybe more. <laughs> that's not oh, is it, is it, would it accord with our, yeah. our policies of bringing people into the town centre? Questions for the case officer? None. Okay, in session. That's it. Go with the recommendation, Joe. Seconder. Everybody? Everybody. Okay. Do you need a second or just a unanimous decision that? As long as you didn't use it as a music studio. Unanimous decision <laughs> Okay, thank you. We come to agenda item number 10. Display of freestanding information board and installation of two uplighters to existing east and west town entry signs at town entry Sankar. The application type is application display adverts. The recommendation is to approve unconditionally. Reference number is 18 stroke 0203 stroke ADV. And uh, the case officer is Jessica. Jessica, take through your presentation, Jessica, please. Uh, you, yeah, you're going to see a, a theme occurring on the next year, a few items, so I'll, I'll run through the photos as quickly as I can. So the first application is for gateways to um, Sanka, um, so, and an information board on the uh, railway station. Uh, so the information board is proposed within the car park, um, and the board would measure approximately 2.2 metres in height by 0.73 metres in width. And we've got uh, the, to the western entrance of um, Sanko on the A76, uh, there's going to be an existing sign that will be repaired, refurbished, uh, and some lighting installed, which is the locations. And again, on the east, uh, again, it'll be repaired and refurbished. So this is the um, information board. And this photograph of, of the uh, station car park. And the eastern entrance to the town, so you can see the existing yeah. sign there and the western with the existing side. It's recommended for approval. Thank you, Jessica. Question of case officer, Joe McKay. Why has the uplighting been refused on Kirkconnell and Kerla home when it's granted for Sanka? Sanka's a royal borough. Well, I would, I would certainly have objected on that, those grounds. We'll, we'll take one at a time, though. A uh, uh, question for the case officer for the uh, uh, agenda item ten. No, it's just, well, it's just uh, why why has uh, uh, Transport Scotland has refused to get Kirkconnell? Kirkconnell's next, Joe. You can ask the question at eleven. We're in ten now. Why why has, has it been granted in one area and no another? It's in the same road. And it's the same sort of lighting. Why has it been granted for one and no the other? Je Jessica, do you know? Jessica. Um, no, I don't know the reason actually. I was just looking at that. Um, <laughs> but they've raised really, they've not raised objections. They were just concerned about the level of the lighting. Um, but actually, we've confirmed with the applicant that the level won't exceed what Transport Scotland won anyway. Is that? Don't know. Andy, questions for officers? No? Okay. For no questions for officers, we're in session. Jane Maitland. No, it was just about the lighting issue, about um, uh, um, whether we, we have policies about lighting going up the way as opposed to down the way. I'm just curious that, that they're, they're, they're 
that, that we're accepting this. I don't, don't know why we wouldn't simply say, look, surely it'd be better to go down the way rather than up. Currently we uplight Sankar Castle, the museum in the toll booth, Sankar Town Hall and the, the parish church. Oh, uplight. So it must be a, a consistency, if nothing else. Members' decisions? Agreed. Come to agenda item number 11. A application for the display of three freestanding town entry signs at town entries and Bridge Kirkconnell. <laughs> <laughs> Reference number 18 stroke 0255 stroke ADV. A recommendation to approve unconditionally. Jessica. Uh, as similar to the last application, three signs are proposed. Uh, western entry point on the A76 and eastern entrance to the A76 and one on Needle Street immediately north of the bridge over the River Nith. Um, again, you see on the right hand side the design. Uh, so, signage design. And so this is the western and the east and the bridge location. And it's recommended for approval. Yeah, yeah uh, so it's two entrance signs. Uh, one north, just beyond the road bridges across the River Nith and Hislop Street and Greystone Avenue. So it's the same sign uh, design as we've just seen on the previous one. And the photographs are this is the eastern side. And We're taking them as two separate items. Uh, yeah, and the next item, the north and south entrance into another location are taken together. Why can we not just do them all together? <coughs> Well, as advice today, we did them individually. And it's Kirkconnell did the first, and this is now Keller Home. Uh, and they do like to be uh, regarded as distinct. Questions for the case officer? In session? Send item 13. Display of two village entry signs at village entries north and south, one like head. Application, application to display. Reference number 18 stroke 0257 stroke ADV. Recommendation approved. Jessica. So this is uh, two uh, signs, one located at the north and one at the south. A slightly different design. So I'll just move on to that. So uh, for one lockhead. Uh, so this is the uh, northern approach and the south approach. And it's recommended for approval. Thank you, Jessica. Questions for the case officer? In session? Indeed. Well then, members, thank you for your forbearance and tolerance. It's been a long day. Thank you very much for your time. I have no other business.